Well, good morning, everyone. I would like to call this meeting to order. At this time, I would like to acknowledge that we meet on the traditional land of Treaty 6 territory and Métis homelands, and acknowledge the diverse indigenous peoples whose ancestors have marked this territory for centuries, such as Cree, Dene, Sotu, Blackfoot, Lakota Sioux, as well as Métis and Inuit, now settlers from around the world. Uh, we'll do a roll call of council colleagues. Councillor Wright. Good morning. Councillor Knack. Good morning. Councillor Prince Bay. Good morning. Councillor Stevenson. Good morning. Uh, Councillor Paquette. Good morning. Right. Councillor Tang. Good morning. Councillor Hamilton. Councillor Rutherford. Good morning. Councillor Salvador. Good morning. Councillor Cartmel. Good morning. Councillor Rice. Good morning. And Councillor Jans. Good morning. All right. Uh, adoption of the agenda. Councillor Hamilton is not here. Councillor Rice, you want to do that? Go ahead, please. Yeah. So I move the, that City Council hear from the following speakers and in panels was uh, appropriate. So 5.2, 4, 2023. Supplement operating we'll come to it. Come, we'll come to that later on. I think it's, that's well, his summary change. Is that's, one. that's a request to speak, right? So, yeah, that's his the number one, and then in the uh, summary of agenda yeah, change. We'll come to, yeah. So, 2023 2026 operating budget. So, that's his landing to that. No. Okay, we're just we'll come, doing, we'll come, uh, yeah, we'll come to that later on at the moment. Yeah, 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 we'll come to that later on. Okay, all right, so please. I need a second for the uh, 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 moving second. of the adoption of the agenda. Second by Councillor uh, Jans. Please vote. In favor. I am a yes. Yes for me. Thank you, Councillor Principe, Councillor Tang, and that was Councillor Jans. I'm a yes, it's not coming up. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Uh, protocol items, I have few on behalf of council. Uh, good morning, everyone. I would like to begin with a council, with a few council recognition items. Tomorrow, November 22nd, is a national housing day. This day is dedicated to raising awareness about housing and houselessness. Unfortunately, not everyone has access to housing. And I believe that it's important to recognize that this problem disproportionately impacts vulnerable populations, such as racialized households, single parent households, and seniors living alone. For example, indigenous peoples are disproportionately affected by houselessness. One in 15 indigenous peoples in urban centers experience houselessness compared to one in, one in 128 for the general population. That is eight times more likely for indigenous peoples. Ultimately, everyone is affected when housing insecurity and houselessness. All Edmontonians benefit when more people in our city feel safe and included. That is why affordable housing is a core priority of Edmonton City Plan. According to Homeward Trust's by name list, there are currently 3,100 unhoused individuals in Edmonton. My heart goes out to each and every one of those community members as they endure the harsh physical, emotional, and mental challenge of living on the streets. Housing is a vital Housing is vital in shaping how people and families interact, grow, and thrive. National Housing Day recognizes the crucial role of housing in leading a productive life and seeking to create innovative solutions to complex housing challenges. In Edmonton, we also recognize these efforts through a month-long campaign with our partners in the housing sector. Most recently, we, we celebrated housing leaders in the nonprofit and private sector through the Affordable Housing Investment Program. With the city's initial funding of $16.7 million, AHIP, 
grant recipients will be able to overcome barriers in the development process and attract further investment for affordable and supportive housing projects. This year, the city is proud to support five projects, bringing 276 new homes to Edmontonians. Projects include three bridge healing facilities for houseless patients leaving hospitals run by Jasper Place Wellness Center. Adapting, to, uh, adapting the old downtown YMCA to residential use and a mixed use market rental building in Southwest Edmonton. I would also like to take this opportunity to recognize city administration and my council colleagues for their tireless work in the, recent pa in the recently, uh, recently passing of Edmonton zoning. But I would like to, let me try it again. I would like to take, uh, take this opportunity to recognize city administration and, 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 and my council colleagues for their tireless work in the recent passing of Edmonton zoning by law renewal. Our goal with the citywide policy overhaul is to facilitate greater access to more diverse housing options and to create more livable and vibrant communities for all Edmontonians. Let's keep this positive moment, momentum going. The City of Edmonton is committed to building equity and meeting housing needs for all those who reside here. The next important item I would like to recognize is the Ukrainian famine and genocide, Holodomor, Memorial Day. This year it is on November 25th. In Canada and nations all over the world, this day recognized the Ukrainian famine of 1932 as an act of genocide. Holodomor, often referred as the Great Famine, was deliberately planned and executed by the Soviet regime under Joseph Stalin. This contributed to the loss of millions of Ukrainian lives and other ethnic minorities in just one year. On the fourth Saturday of November each year, we join our Ukrainian community members throughout Edmonton in remembering the victims of Holodomor. To bring to light information about the famine and genocide that, that, that was hidden, distorted and destroyed by Soviet authorities. And to celebrate multiculturalism in Canada, defend human rights and uphold peace. Holodomor is a lesson on how prejudice, oppression and the misuse of power can lead to horrific consequences. Unfortunately, we have seen these themes continue in the recent history. By raising awareness about the Holodomor and by promoting Ukrainian culture, business and social interests, the city of Edmonton stands with Ukrainian Edmontonians. By coming together, we can create an, a city where every individual belongs. This is the foundation of the city's anti-racism strategy. Along with social agency partners in Edmonton, city administration and other city bodies Council shares the goal of creating a safe and welcoming place where we all can thrive. We will also be co-hosting an event with the Edmonton branch of the Ukrainian Canadian Congress to commemorate the Holodomor on November 25th at 12.30 p.m. here at City Hall. I invite those who wish to attend. Thank you. Next, we go to select items for debate. Here, so he did you want to read out your speech? Yes, before I we get will. To that? I will. Here we go. All right. So, welcome to the November twenty first, twenty twenty three City Council budget meeting. This meeting is scheduled for five days, beginning today and continuing on November 22nd, 27th, 28th, and 29th, 2023, if required. Before we start, I will explain the process that will begin this morning. First, administration has, an inform First, administration has information to present to you, to us this morning. While the majority of the presentation will be in public, I understand that part of the presentation will, will need to, we need to go into private. After the presentation, we will then have a chance to ask questions of administration in private if required and then in public. At 1.30 p.m., we have the following organizations available to answer any questions council may have. Edmonton Police Commission, Edmonton Police Service. 
Edmonton Public Library, and Poverty Edmonton, Explore Edmonton, and GEF ho Seniors Housing. Once questions of these organizations are complete, Council will then continue asking questions of administration. As a reminder, Council approved the 2023-2026 budget last December. What is before us today are four separate sets of proposed adjustments, capital, operating, Blatchford utility, and the waste utility. Following questions on any of the matters before us today, Council will move on to debate the budget adjustment, beginning with the supplemental capital budget adjustment, and then move on to supplemental operating budget adjustment. If there are no questions or proposed changes to either the Blatchford or the waste utilities, as these were already discussed at the utility committee, I would suggest that those budgets be voted on first, followed by the bylaw. I will have more comments on our procedures for the next few days after we hear from administration and finish our questions. Uh, so we, the select items were already selected, right, Kirk? And uh, no, no items have been selected. Yes, yeah, so we need to do that, right? So let's do that, then we'll proceed with the rest of the. Uh, okay, who would like to? Uh, Sign up. Okay, Councilor Jans. Uh, thank you. I'll select five one, five two, five three, five four, five five, five and seven one. Five two, five three, five four, five five, seven one. I think that's everything we have. To yes. Do. Okay. Thank you, Councilor Jans. Uh, vote on the reports not selected for debate. We don't have any. Uh, request to speak. No, Councillor Rice. Can you please, uh, uh, just before you go, that actually uh, uh, we do not hear mem from members of council, some members of public at council, and I would uh, suggest that we carry on with that tradition. So we would not be hearing from uh, 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 members of public at council. Okay. And then we just told them. Uh, uh, request for specific time on the agenda. Councillor Rice. Yeah, go ahead, please. So. <laughs> I move that the following item be deal with, with at a specific time on the agenda. Number four, questions of boards and authorities, 1.30 p.m. on Tuesday, November 21st, 2023. Okay. Need a seconder? Second. Councilor Neck, okay. please vote. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. We have all the votes. Okay, display the votes, please. That is carried. Uh, vote on bylaws not select for debate. We don't have any uh, any consular yeah. inquiries. No uh, questions to boards and authorities will be dealt at 1.30. Public reports. All right, now we'll go to administration for a presentation. Great, thank you very much, uh, Mayor and Council. Good morning. Today we begin the important task of deliberating the adjustments to the 2023 to 2026 budgets. Budget 23 to 26 set the city on strong foundation to realize the goals of Connect Edmonton and the city plan. The budget adjustment provides the opportunity to respond to changes in our environment, both to capitalize our, on opportunities and to recalibrate as a result of changing economic conditions and contracts. An increase of 7.09%, two percentage points above what was set through budget 23 to 26 is very difficult for Edmontonians and businesses. And we know that they are struggling to manage inflationary pressures in their household and business budgets. We also know that when we ask for funds from Edmontonians, we need to be clear about how they are spent. This presentation is intended to provide you with additional context that may be helpful as you proceed with your deliberations. First, I want to show you how the draft 7.09% tax levy increase breaks down. 
A 3.8% increase helps maintain the high quality core services that support Edmontonians as they navigate and experience their community. A 0.3% increase is a result of the council directed items including enhanced snow and ice control, urban planning and economy, city plan implementation and funding for reach. A 0.4% increase is required to grow existing services including transit on demand services, anti-racism as well as preparation for the 2025 election. A 0 0.1, sorry, a 0.6% increase is new or enhanced services including energy transition, corporate integrated data solutions and enhancements in transit off peak and on demand services. Another 0.3 increase addresses the operating impacts of capital projects, most notably the Metro to Blatchford LRT. And finally, a 1.6% increase to accommodate for the arbitrated salary settlement as well as the implementing of council approved Edmund Police Service funding formula. This provides stable and predictable funding to help support a high quality of public safety services. Now, I also want to say again that we have already taken action to mitigate some of the pressures the city is facing. And without actions by departments, the city ha would have required an additional 1.34% tax levy increase to cover 26 million in previously unfunded pressures. And this would have resulted in a total of 8.43% tax levy increase. And I've been asked to explain some of the breakdown of this. So while this is not ideal, this internal pressure can create opportunities for efficiency and we look to all of our business areas to apply a continuous improvement lens to all the, the work that they're doing. There is some risk in absorbing cost pressures within the budget and we know that if we do this uh, for too long, for too often, it can actually erode services that residents depend on as we've seen in the past in, in things like snow and ice control. Uh, actions undertaken by city departments allowed administration to bring forward the draft 7.09% tax increase. Now in the interest of time, this, this slide outlines a few examples of what we managed to nest in the existing budget to cover that 26 million. First, fleet and facility service is working to manage within their budgets an estimated 4.8 million for higher costs for parts, an estimated 1.2 million in inflationary pressures on existing contracts, and 1.2 million in costs related to vandalism. Parks and Road Services is managing a greater inventory of open spaces and roadway inventory. We're also tasked, we've also tasked them with safety and security improvements to ensure Edmontons have access to outdoor amenities and well-maintained roads. Fire Rescue Services is absorbing the cost of the temporary to permanent conversion for the Community Property and Safety Team program within their regular, regular operations. And regarding the growth of the team to match the unfunded service packages, we will consider how this can be addressed through corporate vacancy management and try to absorb that as well. Finally, the city manager's office is stepping in to fund the costs of the housing task force and additional supports to help build capacity for indigenous governments engaged in city consultation and in our, in our partnerships. However, we could not uh, absorb the costs of uh, the new dollars into the budget to address cybersecurity projects. While we tried to look at that, we just could not find a way of doing that. Now, because municipal government services are so critical to the daily lives of Edmontonians, I want to spend a few moments to put the expenses in the context of an average household. There are a diverse array of expenses that comprise the spending of the average household, and in our daily lives, we encounter many financial obligations from the necessities like clothing, food, transportation, general household operations, and shelter. Covering these costs is vital for maintaining our quality of life, and those costs are increasing for everyone. However, beyond these day-to-day -day costs, there's another significant contributor to our household expenses, and they are taxes. Taxes are an essential component of any modern society supporting the services and infrastructure we rely on. They can be categorized by levels of government with federal, provincial, and municipal authorities each pay, playing a role in the tax burdens of our residents. In contrast, municipal taxes represent the lowest portion of our overall tax burden, and one of the lowest expenditure lines for a household, approximately 2.4% of the average household expenses in 2019. Municipal governments are the closest to our daily lives, managing services like local infrastructure, public safety and waste management. However, unlike other levels of government, municipalities have limited options for renewing re revenue generation. They are primarily, primarily reliant on user fees, fines, permits and property taxes. The challenges faced by municipalities in gener generating revenue highlight the delicate balance between fiscal responsibility and the need to maintain essential local services. 
The revenue limitations faced by municipalities underscore the importance of careful financial management at the local level where our communities thrive. On behalf of Edmontonians, the City of Edmonton stewards a multi-billion dollar operating budget, as you can see on this slide. Our largest expenditures are for the services and infrastructure that support core service delivery, and this includes police services, transit services, parks and road services, fire rescue services, support services, community recreation, and city planning and infrastructure services. We work closely with our federal and provincial counterparts to identify areas where we can leverage their funding to offset our costs, either to continue our base operations or to enhance existing core services. Keeping in mind that some of these expenses, such as transit uh, and recreation fees, fees are also offset by user fees. Now, I'll, what I'll do now is talk about tax dollars providing value for Edmontonians. This tip, a typical household with an assessed value of $425,500 is paying about 8.17 per day in 2023. This is a by service breakdown of the information I showed on the previous slide. And if the full 7.09 increase is levied, the daily rate moves to about $8.74 per day. Police, transit, social services, library and roads, uh, all of that is provided in these costs under a dollar, under $9 a day. So while we are focusing today on the increase, I want to remember, remember the underlying value of the services provided as well. Now through the last few years, there's been several discussions related to police funding and I'd like to address some questions in this next section. Policing is a core service, although it is delivered through a different governance structure. Council determines the funding and the Edmonton Police Commission determines the allocation of that funding. When looking at police, it is important to look at expenses that reflects the total cost to deliver a police service. So that is what we have tried to illustrate on this slide. Police funding as a percentage of the total expenditure budget has hovered consistently around 15%. The formula has a constraint built in that limits the funding the city provides to police when the ratio of police expenditures to civic departments changes. There have been a number of changes in the budget over the last few years, including the pausing and then reestablishing of a funding formula, a reallocation of police funding to community safety and well-being, and a transition uh, funding from uh, TASER to funding with tax levy. And these things can make the year-over-year -year comparisons uh, a little challenging, so I just want to take a moment to walk through the change to the police budget. The increase in the Edmonton Police Service budget totaling 43.9 million warrants a closer examination to provide clarity on the factors contributing to its increase as we know it is a significant number. Each aspect of this budgetary adjustment reflects a conscientious, sorry, a conscientious consideration of individual decisions aimed at enhancing the safety and well-being of our community. A substantial portion of the increase amounting to 9 million also originates from a grant issued by the government of Alberta and I'm confident that this grant, grant will fa pay for the full costs uh, of the uh, additional police officers that they will be providing money for. To mitigate the impact on the budget, 0.4 million has been offset through an increase in revenue. Furthermore, 2.9 million is allocated to the final year of community safety and well-being funding for the Healthy Streets Operations Centre and this funding will transition to being supported within the funding formula beginning in 2025. The decision by Council to proceed with a funding formula is contributing $11.8 million to the overall increase, aligning with our commitment to delivering effective and efficient police services to the community and responding to the request for public safety. A significant portion, $19.7 million, represents the direct result of arbitrated salary settlements. This reflects our commitment to providing fair compensation to the officers, essentially for maintaining the high standard of service that we expect in our community. This is a total of 34.4 million being transferred to the Edmonton Police Service. It's crucial to note that 18.4 million has already been approved within the previous 4.96% tax levy increase. An additional 16 million equivalent 0.8% is required within the proposed 2.13% increase. In conclusion, the increase of the Edmonton Police Service budget is I think thoughtful and, strate and a strategic response to various factors including additional officer recruitment, community safety and well-being, public safety, council's decisions and fair compensation for um, officers on the front line. Our commitment remains steadfast in ensuring the safety and security of our community while being mindful of fiscal responsibility. 
Now behind all the services the city provides is a workforce of approximately 11,000 people. I've heard questions in the last several weeks from Edmontonians about whether we have the right balance of the workforce. Over the past five years, our workforce has steadily had nearly 80%, has, sorry, has steadied at nearly 80% unionized workers, essentially frontline workers. Beyond that, nearly an additional 10% are unionized supervisors, meaning they're people directly connected to providing those core frontline services. And just over 10% are professional management and, and or out of scope staff. They are the people leading the organization, managing projects, meeting our legal requirements, and being held accountable for their results. Specifically, we have seen significant movement in the senior leadership complement. As you know, I decreased the number of departments by two and have elevated or added important perspectives to the executive leadership team without having to appoint deputy city managers to do that. The adjustment to the number of senior leaders brought savings. Some were included in OP 12 and one was reallocated to cover the position of chief climate officer. As a result of the decrease in the number of departments, there was a net reduction in up to four branch managers as well and several directors. I think our balance is, right, is roughly right and I think this slide helps show that. Nine of 10 city staff focused on providing services and one of 10 providing leadership and oversight to support a safe, helpful, accountable, integrated and excellent service uh, workplace and workforce. By comparison, 23% of the government of Alberta workforce is out of scope and 17% of the city of Calgary workforce is out of scope. We also pay less money to our managers than Calgary, including city managers, deputy city managers, or general managers and branch managers and directors. And finally, the city of Edmonton does not provide executive perks such as fleet vehicles or fleet uh, vehicle allowances to any of our executives. And this is different from some of our other comparators on this slide as well. A second view of the workforce shows that the composition based on supervisory status, regardless of union or non-union status. In response to the Office of the City Auditor's Performance and Productivity Audit, Management Staffing Analysis Administration reduced overall supervisor staffing by 145 FTE in relation to Council's reduction targets in a way that is comprehensive, transparent and accurate. And this was uh, also explained by the auditor after those recommendations had been implemented and had the auditor had come back to council and explained that all the recommendations had been implemented. As illustrated in 2023, 84.9% of all city employees are now non-supervisory service or frontline staff. The remaining 15.1% are supervisory staff who align within the office of the city auditor's definition and this includes supervisor positions uh, with one or more FTE, thus this includes all unionized leaders and management staff who supervise another city employee. So they are not all uh, managers are opted out. With additional work happening, such as investing in our core services, completing the jurisdictional review, vacancy management and the review of other, of other work, administration is confident that we're achieving the appropriate balance to serve Edmontonians. I am also not done with examining this balance and there will continue to be efficiencies made at the appropriate time. As we move forward, I'm doing so in a way that does not require severance, such as the recent elimination of a director position for the protocol office, which uh, gets moved to frontline staff that can support council in their work um, and eliminates one more director position. And now I'll hand over to Stacy for uh, some discussion on core services. This is a budget adjustment aimed at protecting core services. As part of the OP12 process, administration undertook a significant exercise to clarify what we considered core services. First, we must align our services with relevant legislation. This includes acts such as the Municipal Government Act, the Occupational Health and Safety Act, and the Emergency Management Act. Ensuring compliance with legal mandates both safeguards the well-being of our residents and also helps us maintain transparency and accountability in our service offerings. Next, we evaluated the practical necessity of a service by examining whether it addresses fundamental needs within our community. Is it a service that residents rely on for their daily lives? Does it contribute directly to the safety, health, and overall well-being of our population? This criterion helps us distinguish between services that are crucial for our community's basic functioning and those that may be more discretionary. This is the distinction between what is need to have versus what is nice to have. 
Finally, we then considered how to align our services with the priorities set by council. For example, arts and culture, community safety and well-being, and economic resilience and growth are identified as three of the six council key priorities. Services which directly contribute to these areas are defined as core. This classification might seem like a straightforward exercise, but there's more to it than meets the eye. Core services are the backbone of an organization, tightly linked to its primary mission and shaped by legal obligations, the reliance on the city to provide this service or the priority of council. They are essentials that keep the organization running. On the other hand, non-core services may play a role in delivering some of these same services, but in many cases, the decision can be made to stop that service. Let's explore some examples. Think about tasks like budget, development, and payroll. These clearly belong in the core category. They are, mandated, they are mandated by law. Conversely, consider activities like business planning and performance. While they're important to the organization's growth and advancement, they fit into the non-core non realm. Their absence wouldn't fundamentally alter the organization's purpose, but they might change how well we achieve this purpose. But let's venture into the gray area. For example, affordable housing. It's undoubtedly a priority for us, reflecting our commitment to the community. However, it's also a responsibility shared with the province. This prompts an intriguing question. Does it firmly fall within the core? This is where things become less clear and where various factors come into play. The process of distinguishing between core and non-core services isn't a straightforward checklist. It's more like a puzzle where legal obligations, organizational objectives, community impact, and available resources interconnect. It's about finding the right pace, place for each piece, considering the broader picture. It's important to acknowledge those areas that are more in the middle. Not every service can be neatly categorized due to the interdependencies and connections. Adaptability is key, recognizing that circumstances change and services might shift between these categories over time. And let's not forget the collaborative aspect. Involving stakeholders in these discussions brings diverse perspectives to the table. As we work through the budget, we need to consider the complexity of core and non-core services. It's not a rigid framework, but rather a dynamic landscape. While we normally speak about 70 lines of service, we look deeper into our services for this analysis. This slide in front of you provides an illustration of the nine public-facing programs encompassing a total of 204 service units. Among these, 119 service units meet the criteria for being core services for our city, while the remaining 85 fall into the category of non-core. Certain service units like transit, lost and found, safety codes compliance and enforcement, peer and mental health support, and building permits inspection and inspections fall under core services due to our legal obligations. These are essential requirements that we are bound to fulfill and these are represented in the darkest green units. The practically necessary services are illustrated with the lighter, green shade, the lighter shade of green. They represent what we aren't legislated to provide, but a significant portion of Edmontonians rely on these non-discretionary services. These include bylaw enforcement, waste collection, business licensing, and street sweeping. Without the city and taxpayer dollars, these services wouldn't be delivered. In yellow, we have service units such as Blatchford Land Development, Chinatown Recovery, Housing and Homelessness, and Problem Properties, which are deemed core services because they align with council priorities. These reflect our commitment to addressing crucial community needs and challenges. Interestingly, there are no service units that simultaneously meet all of the criteria, the legal requirement, the council priority, and the practically necessary. Further, still, there are some that are deemed non-core as we work, and as we work through the details, we encounter, in, encounter instances that add some complexity. Some service units, such as maintenance of skate parks, splash parks, and green shack, fall in the non-core category simply because the facilities themselves are considered non-core. And even though we're legally required to maintain them once we have them. This introduces a thought-provoking question. Do these specific lines of business align with our future vision? or should we contemplate a phased approach toward divesting of them? As we chart our course, it's imperative that we weigh the benefits, community engagement, and resource allocation for these services, ensuring they align harmoniously with our overarching goals. 
This highlights the complexity of our decision-making processes where various factors influence the categorization. This next slide shows the supporting services. There are a total of 174 service units with 116 as core services and the remaining 58 as non-core. We see significant core services related to financial sustainability and project and asset management. Building on the complexity from the last slide, some of the non-core services here include service units like open data and corporate economics that are discretionary, but certainly impact the quality and timeliness of data-driven decisions that informs other services. With these services, we also see a greater proportion of supporting services that are legally required, like budget development, taxation, asset management, payroll, environmental compliance, compared to public services. There are also a few direct connections to council priorities in the supporting services with only diversity, equity, and social inclusion, indigenous awareness, and engagement, sorry, indigenous awareness and engagement, environmental education, and advisory, and the LRT expansion that arise here. Between the public and supporting services, approximately 8% of the total service aligns with council's six priorities. Finally, both the supporting and public services are similarly balanced between core and non-core services at approximately 60% of services being assessed as core. In summary, the illustrations you see provide a snapshot of our organizational landscape. Beyond the visual representation, it underscores our commitment to serving the community effectively, balancing legal obligations, practically necessary services, and council priorities. The last consideration with respect to core and non-core services is that it's important to recognize that some of our services respond to challenges that we, as a municipality, do not bear sole responsibility for. Some service units have evolved based on provincial service level changes like animal welfare, while other non-core services have been paused locally while we leverage federal programs like the census. As we see with services like community grants and infrastructure, the solutions, both action and funding, require collaborative approach that extends beyond our boundaries, involving us, our regional partners, and other levels of government. Here, we are succeeding together. In other examples, while the service units reflect our priorities, they do not reflect all of our, they do not all reflect our sole accountability. This applies to housing, environment, economic stewardship, and mental health, among others. It's crucial to note that our intention, is to not sh our intention is not to shy away from our responsibilities, but rather to emphasize the power of unity and collaboration. We need to be cautious to not overinvest in services that should be shared, but we must advocate for the balanced distribution of re resources. This will allow us to collaborate to achieve sustainable solutions in all programs and services and be effective in fulfilling our primary duty as a municipality. I'll now pass it back to Andre. Thanks, Stacey. Um, while the OP12 uh, op amendment from last year and this budget adjustment are, are separate, I've also been asked by councils, councillors over the last few weeks if we can show the, the linkages between those. So the next couple of slides are focused on that. While we've absorbed some costs, we have also been making decisions that are contributing to the 240 million portion of OP12. These are the ideas brought forward over the past couple of months, which are currently uh, or soon to be working their way to implementation. A total of 67 point million in savings is underway. Of that, 11.2 million has been allocated to higher priority projects or core services. For example, as a result of the changes to the Sandbox program, $800,000 per year or 3.2 million in savings over the cycle has been reinvested back into the snow and ice control program on the front line. A total of 7.3 million in additional costs relating to transition of frontline from temporary seasonal to permanent have been absorbed within the impacted departments. And 0.7 million has been reallocated from a branch manager position to focus on a climate action position. This leaves a total of 3.4 million to allocate on an ongoing basis. We've also found some other one-time savings uh, of 34 million in the savings from Valley Line South East. 4.7 million is allocated to a capital renewal project that scored as a high risk to address a portion of the need to bring cell service into the LRT tunnel system. And 5.1 million is allocated to fund snow and ice control on a one-time basis, providing enhanced services one year earlier than planned. 
This leaves a total of 36.5 million in funding for Council to reallocate to high priority areas on a one-time basis. As we proceed through this adjustment, we have two slides that may be helpful for you to consider all of the various options available. Each off option comes with its benefits and challenges, uh, and as an administration, we are standing behind you, ready to provide the information you may require to help you determine any specific budget adjustments. This slide reviews ongoing operating funding options and potential implications. And this slide provides you with some one-time and capital funding options and implications. Now, related to the funding sources you have available to consider, uh, let me start by saying you have 525,000 in each of 24, 25, and 26 in council contingency used to fund one-time items. Council has uh, also has 357,000 in unallocated council contingency from 2023. There is $8 million in ongoing funding starting in 2024 as a result of an increase to the EPCOR dividend. There is $3.4 million in ongoing funding and $36.5 million in one-time funding generated from OP12. And for community safety and well-being, there is $1.355 million available ongoing in 24 and increasing to $2.504 million in 2025. Now, um, if the budget adjustment does not pass, we revert to what you have previously approved through budget 2326. However, the 2024 funding will not reflect our current circumstance, which includes some uh, council approved funding to the Edmonton Police Service. If we stay the course with an unaltered budget, we would need to look to absorb additional pressures at a time when we are looking uh, at core services erosion as well. Although 7.09% is a hard number for Edmontonians to see in the headlines, 8.47 a day keeps the community moving forward to achieve the direction of Connect Edmonton and the city plan while receiving the public services that support a good quality of life here in the city. Uh, and now, Mr. Mayor, we do request to transition to a private conversation to address uh, a few minor items uh, that should be presented in private, subject to Section 21, 24, and 25 of the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act. Okay, so we'll go in private and come back, uh, but go in private, ask questions on the private items, and come back, ask questions on the public uh, items. Okay, good. good. Can someone move that we go in pub uh, camera, please? So, so moved. moved. Councilor Wright. Councilor Wright, Councilor Principe second, Councilor Wright seconded. Councilor Wright moved, Councilor Wright seconded. Okay, please vote. I'm a, I'm a yes. Thank you, Councilor Stevenson. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. We'll give you a couple of minutes to uh,
So we'll, uh, we are back in public. Yes, we are live from chamber. Okay, we're back in public. Got it. Okay, so we'll take a break now, and we'll be back at 1.30 with agencies.
from council chamber. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I would like to uh, uh, bring this meeting back to uh, order. We'll do a roll call of council colleagues. Councilor Wright. Good afternoon. Councilor Knack. Good afternoon. Councilor Prince Bay. Hello. Councilor Stevenson. Good afternoon. Councilor Paquette. Good afternoon. Councilor Tang. Good afternoon. Councilor Hamilton. Councillor Hamilton is away uh, on uh, council duty. She might be joining us off and on uh, uh, as she becomes available as Councillor Paquette, right? And uh, Councillor Rutherford. Hello. Councillor Salvador. Hello. Councillor Cartmel. Good afternoon. Councillor Rice. Good afternoon. And Councillor Jens. Good afternoon. Okay. Uh, we are now on to. 1.30 time specific, which is to uh, uh, engage with our boards and authorities. Uh, I think we're going to start with the Edmonton Police Commission and Edmonton Police Service first, right, Clerk? I don't believe there's an order. I there's believe no order. the process is to just, uh, uh, we would have counselors go in the queue uh, as So there's no pre there's no presentations from that's, the- That's correct. Okay, just questions, okay. All right, questions, colleagues. Councillor Jens, you selected this, you wanna start? I'm happy to yield to my colleagues. All right, who wants to start now? Councillor, one, two, three. If not, it'll be very quick conversation. No, sign up. Go ahead, Councillor Stevenson. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you all for being here today. Um, I maybe just want to start with with Explore Edmonton. Um, so, so there, there is a budget ask. I, the question I have is just around some of the tension I think I've, I've felt between um, sort of the mandate and mission that, that you were given or that you were formed with, and then some of the things that you have ended up being responsible for. Um, so wondering if you could speak to that and you know, appreciating that some of the budget ask is to cover those elements, sort of the outside of core mission mandate elements you know, what, what alternatives do you see in terms of um, offloading some of those functions, I guess, to put it, to put it bluntly? Thank you, Councillor. And I'm here with our board chair, vice chair, and other members of our board and executive uh, committee. Um, when EEDC was uh, adjusted in terms of its mandate, um, it was assigned an $11.7 million annual investment from the City of Edmonton. Subsequent to that, uh, Northlands um, was wound down and all of those ag assets, um, the venues, the, the events, and all of the agricultural programming was transitioned to Explore Edmonton, as was K-Days, um, our, our major exhibition and uh, fair. 
Um, and that comes with it, things like CFR, for example, which we bid and which we were successful for um, next year. What was not adjusted was the annual investment from the City of Edmonton to match that. And so it requires about a $20 million investment from the city on an overall operating budget of $90 million. So that's about a fifth of the budget. Now, we've been able to significantly rationalize overhead costs. So, for example, if you took the operating budgets of Northlands and combined them uh, with tourism and the other components, it would be a much larger overall budget. But by utilizing services like human resources and like finance, we can implement those programs at a much uh, lower cost. The other piece that we have done, and this was from direction from you in previous meetings, was to seek funding from other orders of government and from private investors. So, for example, if we think about something like K-Days or the uh, lands at Klondike Park at the uh, exhibition site, we received $10 million from the federal government to be able to invest in those lands and to rebuild K-Days because, of course, it didn't operate for a period of time. In addition, uh, the way to offset the overall cost but still be able to deliver programming to Edmontonians and to visitors, we've worked a lot on private sponsorships. So if we use the Canadian Finals Rodeo bid as an example, uh, the city made um, a $300,000 commitment, which allowed us to leverage $1.5 million from the province, as well as a million dollars from our hotel groups, and then a number of other private investors to be able to get that bid back to Edmonton. Great, yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot of great strategies outlined there. Um, uh, and strategies sort of on the basis of continuing to move forward with all of those elements that you're responsible for. So have there ever been any conversations about things that you want to stop doing, for example? Yeah, I think it's, it's also the pace of expansion. So, um, for example, when we started K-Days or when we started Farm Fair or the urban, or the urban farm, um, we have been uh, increasing the delivery of programming, but not with an increasing cost. So when we started uh, K-Days, for example, it was just it was just the Ferris wheel. It wasn't the EDI programming around it. Um, again, you know, if you want to ask is sort of a really direct question about what we would do if this wasn't funded, we would need to look at all of the programs subsequent to the uh, Edmonton Tourism or the Explore. Edmonton uh, start from EEDC, so we would need to look at everything from K-Days to uh, Farm Fair to to which bids we, you know, we can no longer afford to pursue. Just as an example, um, you know, these bids don't generate revenue to the city, they generate economic impact and they generate uh, wealth to the small businesses. So, you know, we have to invest hundreds of thousands of dollars to achieve and to win the bid for the National Volleyball Championship that comes back next year. And although that is, a, you know, a 30 plus million dollar economic impact, we don't get a revenue stream to that bottom line. So if we were to make those cuts, um, in addition to the examples I provided you, it would mean that those kinds of bids we could no longer in invest in pursuing. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Uh, Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you, Mayor Sohi. And so my first question also goes to Explore Edmonton. Um, so the request is about over $10 million. Uh, that is to support the increased mandate and the scope funding. Um, my question is, I recall council approved some like event support Edmonton event funding. I don't have the exact number uh, in front of me. I just want to say what's the difference or overlap and between that event funding we've approved and with this new request? Yes, thanks Thanks for that question. And if we use, you know, Canadian Finals Rodeo as an example, um, the relationship between Explore Edmonton and the City of Edmonton, um, I think, is, is unique across Canada and is a differentiator and an advantage for us. So whether it's the Canadian Finals Rodeo or whether it's Juno's or whether it's the CCMAs coming up, collectively we may invest uh, so that not one entity is funding the entire bid 
to, uh, to be able to successfully get that event to Edmonton. But then we also have different responsibilities in terms of how we produce that event. So the city, of course, uh, looks after um, things like transportation, signage, some of the technical components. We would support in activations, for example. So you'll recall with the Junos, although there were two formal Junos events and broadcast nights, we worked with private investors to build out 50 other concerts in support of that. So the idea is, first of all, that we share the financial burden and, and investment. And then once we have the bid in events, we, we also each have a different role in how those are produced. Uh, then my next related question is about for the events and for the scope and the mandates Explore Edmonton and is going to do here. And then what is your plan and for the allocation for this $10 million in terms of the culture events and the sports event or other type of events? Yes, thanks. So um, significantly, so if we look at that, the $10 million, it is, it is spread amongst our key activities. So first, uh, significantly the Expo Center and the Convention Center, uh, generally they're managed and operated and owned by municipal entities because they're not intended to produce revenue, but they're significant economic drivers. So part of the investment goes to both of those facilities in terms of um, just regular maintenance, as well as the sales teams that we put into the market to achieve those conventions uh, that, we, that we get in. The other component of the funding um, is allocated to destination development and marketing. So um, that would include, we, we, are the, we are the marketing and brand entity for the city of Edmonton internationally to attract not just business, culture, and sporting events, but consumers and leisure travelers into, into our region. So we, we are the entity that does that for you. Um, so of course, a component of, of that would be allocated there. And, um, and as I said, um, a couple of the other uh, key, key areas are around the event attraction that we talked about, as well as uh, the major events that we produce around K-Days, Farm Fair, um, Urban Farm, CFR. So what I heard here is this $10 million or cover operational and also some like uh, facility compact uh, capital maintenance as well. And so it's like this wide range of the cost to be covered under this $10 million. Yes, yes, because it goes across all of our portfolios. And again, yeah. as a, it's, uh, it's, it's quite diverse. To be, to be clear, the city of Edmonton owns the convention center and expo center. Yeah. It is part of your regular major renewals. So the re major renew and uh, so will be part of the renew funding and for this facilities, capital facilities. Yes, yeah, so for for example. So you will not request additional and a capital maintenance fund? No, the capital maintenance fund is developed through the city of Edmonton. They consult with us, but we don't have an additional ask there. So this $10 million does not cover that? Correct, so this $10 million would cover things like carpet, um, improvements to washroom areas, improvement to our culinary areas, the city's capital plan would cover more major structural capital renewals. Okay, thank, thank you for your answer. I may have one more question. I will come back later on. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Councillor Wright. Thank you very much. Um, I start off with the Edmonton Police Commission. I'm just wondering, um, so with the police funding formula that was approved, um, of which I voted in support of, I'm, I'm just wondering, the funds don't seem to be being used yet. Um, so I mean, some of it, uh, there seems to be, and I'm going back to the report from the consent agenda from the police commission meeting. Um, there's, we're still sort of, I guess, in a uh, needing police officers, 96, according to the report. Um, and then I think there's also some fleet vehicles that we're looking at being purchased, but, um, they, those have been delayed because of the supply chain issue. I'm just wondering, is there any, any sort of plan of what, what might be done in the end with this additional money that's not being used? Uh, Councillor Wright, the money hasn't come in yet, of course, because the funding formula policy would apply to 2024. 
So all of the, the growth money, and I, I think it's 11.8 million as it's reflected in the budget books, is earmarked for the growth that you, know, that you spoke of, which is additional personnel uh, and addressing inflationary pressures that exist outside of personnel uh, discussion. But, okay, so what, what, I guess, maybe what are you doing then to um, increase recruitment of the officers? Well, that's a, that's a great question. So uh, this year we have uh, engaged the services of uh, two experts in the human resources and recruiting field to increase our exposure uh, so that we have more people applying to become police officers with the Edmonton Police Service. Uh, as it stands right now, in 2022, we had 410, I believe, completed applications to become a police officer in Edmonton, and we are on a trajectory this year to increase that. We're expecting it to be in the neighborhood of 600 completed applications. So we're very pleased with the uptick and in, in the interest that we're getting from young leaders inside and outside of Edmonton. Another thing that we're doing is we are uh, advocating shortly with the Alberta Association of Chiefs of Police to the province of Alberta to help to include policing in the Alberta Advantage Express Entry Program for experienced international police officers who will be able to get advanced standing in uh, permanent resident status so that we can expect to see a greater influx of talent uh, from the international community of which there's a lot of interest but of course moving countries, uh, there's a lot that goes along Big with move. that. I, and I'm looking at the mayor, I think he at one point was in charge of this for the country. So uh, we, are, we are advocating with the province uh, in that sense as well. Our recruiters are, are out every day uh, on trips locally within the province of Alberta and uh, externally uh, advocating for there to be uh, more people interested in joining policing. In addition to that, we have created and are in the midst of putting together a tiered policing program in Edmonton where our ideal is to attract people who may be interested in a policing career or a para-policing career. So what we do is we create a team of uh, people who will be able to support our frontline members and take on tasks that may not traditionally be responded to by those who have gone through uh, full police training. So. Those are just some of the things that we're endeavoring to do to increase the uh, public safety uh, personnel in, in so Edmonton. So would that be more along the lines then of a, like a, a peace officer and then at that, that level and then move up to no, police? No, it, it, we're not endeavoring to, to moniker the person a peace officer. Uh, there are other jurisdictions in Canada who have special constable programs. It's more akin to that. Okay, okay. And um, I think I better yield the rest of my time. I'll come back. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, no worries. There'll be there's plenty of time. Uh, Councillor Tang. Great. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> maybe I'll start with uh, Don. Uh, thank you for thank all of you for being here. Um, so this is the the packaging that you're advocating for is the lodge staff increase. Are you seeing kind of a proportional increase in residents too? Yeah, the uh, re residents have maintained their normal uh, growth patterns, Councillor Tang. What it was essential here is that we're seeing um, an issue of, of uh, service levels. This is not about creating new services. This is about meeting the essential needs of our seniors. Uh, we learned something over the, um, over the uh, COVID times about the needs of our seniors. Uh, simple things about accessing food in the lodge is a, is a primary problem that we're, we're, we're dealing with. Um, we've spent the last two years reviewing our staffing issues as well as our financial realities. And we haven't done that review in over 15 years. And we've learned that we're way behind in terms of providing the appropriate levels of service. Not Cadillac service, but a service that's essential to our, to our, our seniors just to be able to access food, access, access uh, social uh, involvement, access uh, the ability to be mobile within our, our system. So they're currently accessing food and accessing service, but you just wanted to be enhanced access. Not quite. We have seniors who, just to be very simple, um, when a senior is using a walker to access a, a buffet, that's very, very difficult. And we learned that over COVID. Uh, so what we're trying to do now is make it that 
seniors can actually access their food without having incidents at that at mm -hmm. those buffet lines. And then I'm wondering because I because I do recall receiving some mission from EPL and Explore around um, how your how your organizations are dealing with um, OP12, which is citywide. You know, lots of um, rethinking of how we deliver service and allocate funding to frontline. Can you, what are some ways GEF is working towards that? We have done that and continue to be uh, interested in cost containment strategies. We, we, we deal with that every day. However, we're at an excess point here. We're not only are we full capacity with our seniors, we're also at a situation where our seniors are demanding more. So this is not about a normal growth pattern. This is an exponential growth pattern, right? So it's dealing with growth plus exponential uh, demands on our and our folks. That's why we're here. So yes, we cost containment is is something we deal with on a daily basis. Did you submit something in writing? In no, terms not to the city. Oh, okay. No. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, and we'll move on to Eric. So Eric, you're today as in poverty Edmonton. Um, so everyone not not EPC. Okay. And um, I ha I think I was anticipating ABCs would be here because they have funding requests. Um, are there any specific funding requests you're here to speak on? Yeah, there's uh, a service package regarding uh, early learning and care. Uh, it's to have a full-time uh, city employee and some consulting dollars. And so that's that's what I'm here to speak to. It's about, it's, it's a little bit under $200,000, but the, the gist of the ask is that the city can play a crucial role in um, building a, a early learning care strategy in our city. Um, the province does not have a strategy and increasingly municipalities are realizing that um, without their own strategy, there's nothing to advocate to the province for. And so we believe the city really needs that strategy so that we can talk to the province about how to spend the hundreds of millions of dollars that have come from the federal government. What exists now is a, a plan or a system that provides subsidies to parents. So parents who have uh, children in daycare pay less for that daycare, but a plan to get uh, affordable quality care does not exist anywhere in this province. And so the idea here is to have a full-time position at the city to help develop that strategy. Okay, so so you're referring to this, uh, the unfunded service package in the addendum, because it came after September 15th, okay. And I guess similar question to uh, that I asked earlier, how, how are you working towards similar kinds of um, budget reallocation, rethinking a service um, uh, kind of exercise that the, that the city is doing that you're undertaking in your organization? Yeah, our intent is to follow the, the city the city, uh, the city plan. So whatever the city manager develops to conduct the review will follow the, the same process. Did you have a written response on that? No, no do okay. you, uh, but I can, I can provide <clears throat> you with one. Okay. No, I'm sorry, I'm just curious because I think we're receiving information in multiple different ways. So just wanted to know who I got that information from and who I didn't. Uh, I'm out of time, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Tang, Councilor Cardinal. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. Thanks everyone for being here today. So uh, back to you, Mr. Nadiak. Uh, just quickly, uh, anything you can offer by way of update on uh, GEF's capital plan? Is, has anything, any new developments, anything changed there? Or is it fairly static? Uh, it's funny you ask, that is an agenda item for this board meeting that happens in about two days, sir. Ah, all right, I look forward to that, because uh, I'll be there. Uh, maybe then to uh, Ms. Martinez, uh, there's a budget ask here that I think is as yet unfunded for um, expanded operation of the Heritage Valley branch. Uh, did you want to just speak briefly to uh, the pressures that you're seeing there? Yes, thank you, Councillor Cartmel. Uh, Heritage Valley, as we had indicated in uh, last year's four-year budget submission, is bursting at the can, can you speak close to the mic? Yeah, Sorry. yeah here you go. Thank can you. Can hear me now? Here is experiencing uh, activity that is, when you factor in the square footage, it's a tiny little 3,000 square foot face, space, higher than any other branch in terms of visits and programs. That community is growing faster, the southwest, than any other population in Edmonton. There, are, There is a dearth of community services there and I think the library is filling that gap and uh, for a modest request of $450,000 effective 2025 we need to know this year so we can work with the landlord to identify a space to expand that will meet a, a tremendous need in the community. Okay, so that was my question. So you don't need operating funding until 2025. That's correct. But there's a need, need to... assurance that we will get that funding in 2025. 
so, now. Yeah, what? so some renovations can be done to that space. That's correct. Do you need funding for renovations, or is that covered with no, the landlord? No, we are able to fund the fit-up within our uh, reserve, so that is uh, something we have, uh, have been able to handle within our, our, our mm -hmm. capital. Yes. So there's no subsequent ask coming no. that way? Okay. No. And then have you explored uh, any sort of strategic or philanthropic uh, um, relationships or contributions or anything of the kind that might help offset that? That's a really good question, and, and the board has a policy that we do not uh, fund ongoing operating with fundraising dollars. We absolutely do that for capital and one-time pilot, but not for ongoing operating. Okay. And so this the branch would expand from 3,000 square feet to roughly what? Would it 10,000 square foot square feet, yes. From three to 10? Yes. Oh, no kidding. And what's the average size of a branch then? It's about 10,000 square foot, 15,000 square foot. Okay, so this yeah. would take it to a standard branch kind it of size? It would take it to a standard size until we're able to uh, work with uh, the city in terms of any rec center development in that area of the city. Right. And if I, I can just add one thing, we've been able to reduce the budget ask from its original in last year at this time through some of the exercises that that council has been asking about today uh, as well as manage some increased utility costs uh, thankfully due to uh, an increase we received from the province for per capita increase based on 2019 population figures okay so what's the updated number then as of today it's uh, four hundred and fifty thousand dollars and it formerly was 1.1 million dollars right so 450 starting in 2025 correct great thank you is there anybody here from Fort Edmonton Park Management Company didn't see anybody. Okay, I think that's my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cardinal. Uh, Councillor Salvador. Yeah, thanks so much, and uh, thanks everyone for being with us today. Uh, I might start with um, and Poverty Edmonton as well. So, you know, just just looking for some reflections on um, just progress as it relates to a strategic plan, and maybe what gaps still exist uh, when we look at. Um, and Poverty Edmonton's ability to, to achieve further results going forward. Uh, first, uh, my apologies to Councillor Tang. I, I misunderstood your question. We did submit a briefing note to all councillors regarding the, the service package, um, regarding and Poverty Edmonton's progress. So we're in the, we're finalizing a strategic plan, but the gist of the strategic plan is uh, to organize uh, the work of and Poverty Edmonton around eight, what we call game changes, but eight pillars, eight, eight concepts and if you do those eight things really well you you would eliminate poverty in, in your community and so the strategic plan that eventually will come to council lays out the medium term strategies for how we will achieve those those objectives within um, the game changers that we have the resources to try to tackle so uh, early learning and care is is one um, housing indigenization uh, anti-racism uh, um, and uh, we're working very closely to bring lived experience into informing the policy work that we'll be advocating for um, uh, with, the, uh, with the three levels of four levels of government. Okay, okay, and as it relates to the request for the early learning and care, you said that that is, I guess it fits in categories of one of those eight. Uh, going forward that would be part of the st strategic plan yeah and it's it's you really need the city at the table uh, the municipality uh, can have a, a really powerful voice when it comes to speaking to the province um, that we we don't have um, you know there's certainly positive means we've had with the federal and provincial ministers um, but the lack of a strategy at the municipal level means that implementation is where it will fall apart um, you know the legacy of the hundreds of millions of dollars that are coming to our province may be cheap childcare, and that would be a, a, a missed opportunity. There's okay. thousands of jobs that can be created, tens of thousands of childcare spaces that uh, can be created to fill the, the, the deserts that exist in our community. Okay, okay, I appreciate that answer. I'm just aware of my time as well, um, so I gotta move along here. Um, just to, to GEF, um, you know, wondering, were there specific uh, performance measures that, that were driving this request that you are sort of targeting but not necessarily meeting? Just looking for some metrics. You know, Councillor, what we've done is we've assessed other entities as to what levels of service they're providing. 
against the expectations through uh, ongoing surveys with our residents, and that, that's exactly the driver for this. It's, it's all about serving the seniors. Uh, today, we're, we're the voice of those seniors. We're speaking out on their behalf, saying these are the services we need to, to maintain a quality of life within these facilities. So that's, that, that comes from, as I said, comes from other entities that we work closely with, with the provincial entity, as well as uh, surveys within. Uh, we meet, uh, we have uh, uh, regular meetings with our residents, um, ongoing. I believe we have up to 200 meetings a year with residents in formal groups uh, to understand those needs, and that's where it's driven. So this is okay. driven by the residents. Okay, that's really helpful. Thank you so much for that answer. Um, and then I'll just turn to Explore Edmonton as well. Um, and of course, you've experienced significant expansion over the last few years, and and just really trying to get a handle on, um, you know, why why now? Can you can you speak to why the timing of this investment uh, is important to you? Sure, thank you. And and we we have an ask this year that was the same as last year. So really, what's what's happened is the base the base investment hasn't been adjusted to the mandate, um, and so uh, because that has happened, we have to come back annually, which is which is not ideal, because of course a lot of the bids that we are seeking to achieve are are multiple years and they're in out years. And as well, um, you know, to get those bids, we often need cooperation from the other funding partners, like the province and the federal governments. We need to know that we that we have a piece of that funding to go to go and um, leverage. Um, and uh, I guess one final point: we used our remaining uh, reserves. So we had an 11.7 our base funding. Uh, we appreciate significantly the $5 million service pack that you funded for us for this year. And uh, the agreement and our work with administration also required that we allocate our full reserves. So we will, the, the $5 million, so that's how we made the 20. We will have no more reserves going into next year. Okay, okay. well I'm out of time. Really about sustainability, predictability is what I'm okay. hearing. Thanks. Thank you, Consul Salvador. Before I go to the next round, I want to take a moment to welcome some students to City Hall. We are joined by kids from uh, Centennial School, Grade 6 class, here with uh, their teacher, uh, Mr. S. Uh, Cavalio, right? And, uh, and uh, they are the ward, they represent, it's a P. Winniwak. Thank you so much for joining us. Your uh, ward counselor is Councillor Hamilton, and she is uh, away uh, in Ottawa working with other municipal counselors uh, and interacting with the federal government, advocating on behalf of municipal, uh, municipal needs. So thank you so much. We are also here today listening and engaging with some of the uh, very important uh, city agencies that uh, we work with, starting with Edmonton Police Commission, Police Service, and, uh, and, and Poverty Edmonton, as well as uh, 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 GEF, Explore Edmonton, Edmonton Libraries, and Chief is here too, if you want to see him. Yeah, Chief is right there, yeah, 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 good. Thank you for joining us. Are you sticking around for uh, for the whole week or uh, just for a day? Just for one day. I understand you will be talking about, uh, uh, you have a mock consul, right? Oh, Mayor. Hi, Mayor. What are you talking about? You were debating whether they should be an elementary Youth Council. Yes. And what did you decide? Well, Why don't you come down here? Come, come down, come, come. We have a lot of time. We have seven days set aside for a council deliberation. <laughs> we were debating whether or not to have an elementary youth council and the final vote was no, it was seven votes to six. <laughs> Two, six, ooh, that is very, very close. 
we have very close, some close words here too, but not that as close. <laughs> Oh, they, before just told them before it, before you uh, uh, say more. I just want to let you know the ward counselor, Councillor Hamilton, that your school was her elementary school as well. That's cool. Yeah. See, very inspiring. She's a city councillor today. Maybe some of you might be sitting in these seats. Right on. That's okay. Sorry. Go ahead, Councillor Cartman. Had a question to you. It, actually, it's not a fair question, so I won't ask it. That's okay. <laughs> Good. How how you like being mayor? It's 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 a pretty fun responsibility. It's a fun responsibility. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. I, yes, that's how I feel all the time. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you so much for saying saying a few words. I hope that uh, that you stick around uh, as long as you want and. Uh, if not, probably see you around, okay? Thank you. All right, take care. Yes. Okay, back to questions. Councillor Jans. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, uh, to EPL, could you comment on um, what fluctuations you've seen in provincial funding over the last few years? We have not received an in increase since 2016. So, uh, sorry, this what, what year? 2016. So, eight so, years. Yes. Wow. So, this was a welcome increase based on 2019 population figures. So, uh, while we would love to see uh, the current population, we will continue to advocate for that for sure. And same question to explore. Um, in the last two years, Travel Alberta has equalized its investments between Edmonton and Calgary, so that's been a, a positive improvement for us. But what monetary value do you know? Um, we were confirmed a million dollars uh, annually with them, and then we work towards, I, I can't. I, what percentage of your overall operations would that be? Uh, well, I mean, our operating budget is about 90 million. We have the confirmed 1 million, and then they uh, provide additional project asks. That does not include the bid asks that they have committed, and they continue to be um, cooperative. I'll try to get a, a cumulative number, and I would also add the CFR investment, where we continue to work with the province right. to equalize between um, some of the investments that they're making in their ag. Uh, programming and what we are so those those uh, discussions are continuing it's part of I think the reason uh, for the additional 1.5 million commitment and GEF Councillor, we just received uh, about I think six hundred and fifty thousand dollars from the government that was and what percentage of your total operating would that be uh, on a budget that's in, in the vicinity of 50 or 60 million it's there's the Mayor, can we please recess? Yeah, we are Wait, going I've to got, recess. I've got more questions. For
Time is up. He had 50. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll start all over again. All right. Go ahead, Councillor Jens. Can can someone please, uh, clerk, uh, start Councillor Jens's time again, please? Uh, huh? Thank you. I, I yes, hold on. Actually, I'm going to make sure that everyone is here. Okay. Let's do a roll call. Councillor Wright. I'm here. Councillor Knack. Good afternoon. Councillor Prince Councillor Stevenson. She's coming short. Yes. Okay. And Councillor Paquette. Councillor Paquette is away, actually. Uh, uh, Councillor Tang. Hello. Councillor Hamilton. They're Councillor Paquette and Hamilton are away in Ottawa uh, on behalf of City Council. Uh, Councillor Rutherford. I'm here. All right. Councillor Salvador. Hello. Councillor Cardmel. Good afternoon. Councillor Rice. Here. Councillor Jans. Good evening. And Councillor Stevenson is here. Okay. Hello. All right, now, Councillor Jans, we'll start your time all over again. Please I go believe ahead. I was with GEF, and uh, you were just, yeah, you were saying provincial uh, commitment. Uh, Councillor uh, Jans, with your permission, uh, I had an epiphany during the, uh, the, the uh, fire alarm, and I would ask that our uh, CFO come down, Mr. Kevin Ma, and he can give you the precise contribution ratios to uh, GEF. Uh, please, if, if the mayor is willing. Yeah, of course, yep. part of the delegation. Uh, uh, Councillor Jens, uh, for the past 20 years, I look at 2004 as a reference point up to 2022. So, City of Edmonton contributed about 17% in 2004, uh, 2022, 16% of the overall revenue, so a de deduction of 1%. For the, for the province of Alberta, it's 15% in 2024 and 14% in 2022. So, it's another 1% deduction. So that tells you that, you know, funding has not increased, it's actually decreased on an inflationary basis. Uh, a lot of the funding comes from actually not from the residents or the, pro or the individual government, but from other services GEF provide to other programs like the self-contained apartments. Right. Okay. Um, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, yeah. Why don't you grab a chair somewhere close to Andre there just in case uh, there are more questions uh, for you. Yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah. Thank you. Go ahead. Go ahead, Michael. So um, I, I have a letter from uh, some stakeholders, uh, business, real estate, et cetera, who are urging council to divest from things that are not core mandate, perceived not core mandate. Um, and I, as we're wrestling with these tensions around limited funds, et cetera, I wanted to give uh, especially sort of the the library explorer and GEF uh, a chance to, to speak to that, the perception that other levels of government should be funding more of what you're doing and we shouldn't be continuing to go back to the property tax base. That we should be, we should be working with you to pressure the government to, to the provincial government to spend more of the billions and instead of us. I don't know if you want to, anyone wants to jump in there. Tracy, you want to start? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, first, I would uh, just note we have about a $90 million operating budget and we ask for an investment from the city of only between 20 and 25, depending on those years, because we agree that the, um, although you are a sole shareholder, that there are others that are, that are getting benefit from our work. So. Um, for example, uh, we do rely on the provincial government. I made reference to the federal government and their investment in uh, K-Days, for example. Our Edmonton Destination Marketing Hotels has made a four-year commitment to us of $5 million a year, um, which is significant. And again, that's, that's private money that they're investing um, in us because they believe that we can market effectively and and bring those back and then finally I'd say the other funder that we have looked to secure is just private private funding so um, You know many of the events that uh, we have whether it's it's hosting local or international uh, visitors those are generally funded by private company investors so people like Kerry Steele or Alberta food processors those kinds of entities so to paraphrase, like the the return on investment to the region is so enormous that it's it's worth it's worth the buy-in from Edmontonians, from tax, the tax base. 
Yes, and I would also note that um, of the that, that we also deliver $3 million of taxes directly back to you through the work that, that we do. So although we fully program for our share, sole shareholder, which is you and the, the citizens of Edmonton, we don't ask that you fully fund the programs. We go and seek that from others. Yeah, and, and I imagine for the library, probably, I don't know, how do, how do we draw that line about deplete, depleting provincial <coughs> funding? I think because it's it's a municipal service, it's pretty typical for, for municipal libraries to be funded majority wise by their by their municipalities. And I think that's been the province has typically funded us around five percent. Um, it doesn't mean that we're gonna avoid advocating for that delta between twenty nineteen and twenty twenty four population. Uh, and it uh, every bit helps. However, I do think that it's it's very common for the municipality to, to provide the bulk of the support for the public libraries that serve their communities. And we really are still the anchor library in Alberta. That that we lend materials through throughout other branches. We, we strengthen the region. We, we do share provincially, and they provide the network to be able to facilitate that resource sharing across the province. Yeah. Thank and you, Thank you, Councillor Yeah. Uh, Councillor Paquette. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, is uh, is Lynn Witt, uh, Wynn still here? Yep. Yeah, okay, great. Yeah, so I was just uh, curious, can you please offer comment on the value of sports and cultural events for Edmonton, um, you know, both in, in like the sociological aspect, but also in the economic aspect? Tracy, you want to answer that or you want to bring on uh, your folks? Councillor Paquette, it's Tracy. Uh, may I, Bednard, may I start with that? And then I'm going to um, maybe bring oh, Janelle yeah. Janice, who's our executive director of Event Attraction. Um, oh, yeah. Okay, sure. Okay, thank you. Um, so first I would just note that the sports, cultural, and businesses, uh, business events that we bring to Edmonton generate an, an, an average and economic impact of about $200 million. And if we look forward into the pipeline and based on our $10 million um, funding ask. We have another $406 million in the pipeline, 70% of which we would secure in the next three years. Um, I would also note that, you know, again, as, as Councillor Jans alluded, we don't ask you to fund the attraction of those events. We ask you to make an investment and then we leverage your dollars with those other entities I'd named. Um, you know, a couple a couple of points that I want to make in addition. First of all, those events are often the way we bring people to Edmonton that wouldn't wouldn't come otherwise. So the idea is whether it's a business, sport, or cultural event, we bring people to this city. Uh, the net promoter score of visitors is very high; it's plus twenty six percent. So we know if they get here, they will want to return. Um, that that speaks in addition to the economic impact of the event itself, as well. Those events drive brand and broadcasting for our city. So if you think about Big Air, the next event we have coming up at Commonwealth, we're using that facility. 80% of what we attract uses City of Edmonton facilities. So we utilize those facilities. That is a global, those are global competitors that are coming and all of those broadcasts um, have not just the imagery of Commonwealth, but of our, of our full downtown. Um, the economic impacts of hotels, of dining, which also drives the quality of life for us. We, Tourism and the people that come here to those events are subsidizing those um, events and those facilities that we use as Edmontonians. And we also seek year-round programming. So, you know, if you think about something like the Junos or Big Air, it's not all in the summer. We're working to make sure that we have something to attract uh, visitors and for residents annually. And then, of course, the, spo the sport, community, culture, and um, diversity impacts that we have. Janelle? There's not much left to say, but I think uh, I think Tracy Tracy touched on a lot of points. Uh, we look at major events, uh, typically in the sport and culture, uh, as part of three kind of differentiating differentiating factors. And Tracy touched a lot on the economic impacts, and that's um, you know hard to argue. Obviously, these are bringing in and driving a ton of room nights, a ton of economic impact to our city. Um, but the reputational benefit of hosting these kind of major events for a city like Edmonton is uh, is almost priceless. Um, something like Heritage Classic, being able to say that millions and millions of people um, around not just Canada but all over 
over all over the the globe were were watching Edmonton. We're watching hockey in Edmonton at one of the the city's uh, iconic uh, stadiums. And uh, so I think the the value of hosting major events isn't just economic, and it's certainly not just reputation. I mean, there's a there's a reason why we are. Uh, you know, number two in Canada and 38th in the world as a major sport hosting destination. And it's because we truly believe in leveraging the power of partnership uh, to achieve great things together. And we do that um, in partnership with uh, with our colleagues at the city of Edmonton to drive uh, more great events to this city, not just to bring si to bring visitors here, but to bring, you know, citizens together and to bring community together. These events allow Edmontonians to feel a connection to their city and to to feel proud of their city and uh, we also are trying our best to ensure that these events are ran more sustainably to your point councillor uh, by working with our responsible events program and our team at Explore Edmonton who walks hand in hand with our event rights holders and our, our meeting organizers to drive sustainability initiatives um, that, that align with the city's plan. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And now for my second question. Just kidding. Yeah. I'm out of time. Okay. Well, you're out of time. Uh, Councillor Prince can you take the chair, please? I'll take the chair. Yeah, I'll start with the uh, uh, police commission and police service. Uh, uh, there's an unfunded service package uh, related to city possibly hiring more bylaw officers to enforce noise uh, by law infractions just want to get a sense from you like your officers do enforce noise by law right yes okay would you be able to share some information not today but in through the commission uh, to give us a sense because uh, i really want to understand because uh, it's your job to do it, right? We want to know that you are doing as effectively as possible, that we are able to communicate that to the public, that you're doing that. So we would, would appreciate some information on that. On the, uh, the officers, 50 officers that province is funding, $9 million allocated, deeply appreciated. Uh, would they be, uh, can all those positions be self-sustained through their funding? Uh, or would there be a requirement for uh, property tax levy requirements into the future for those officers? No, they'll be self-sustaining is the direction that we Okay, that would include future settlements, wage settlements, pressures, inflationary equipment pressures, and all that, right? So yeah, our all indications are yes. Okay, because that's very good. I, I'm appreciative of that because I remember when 2008, province stepped up to provide 100 police officers, but the total cost per officer was capped at $100,000, and we had to make up the uh, the, the balance uh, over time. Very good. Thank you so much for that. Uh, on the, uh, uh, now you're hiring more officers based on uh, the policy that council approved, the funding formula that council approved. So you're moving ahead with the recruitment and uh, you know, very happy to hear that you're going international in that, right, to attract. What will happen? What will happen if uh, the policy that we approved is not backed by the funding that policy requires? That's a great question, and, and I, I wish to add just briefly that yes, we are recruiting more, and I failed to mention this uh, to Councillor Wright, that we've increased our class sizes for recruit training classes as well. We have marketed and have run two experienced officer classes for police officers that serve within Canada but wish to come to Edmonton. Uh, the problem with what you've suggested, Mr. Mayor, is we find ourselves in a strategic delta again where when we are expecting a funding level uh, to come and we do not receive that funding, we have to go back and determine where we have the ability to remove money from our ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And we're still playing catch up right now to make sure that there are enough police officers available. So I think that if there were to be adjustments made to 
you know, the operating budget specifically relative to the funding formula. It would cause us to, again, once have to butt up against a strategic goal of supporting and developing talent and making sure that we have sufficient amount of police officers to be on the street mm -hmm. in our communities. So we, we would not be living the spirit of the policy that we approved. That's a very fair statement. Okay. Uh, because when I look at the, the change from 4.9% or even said, look at the over 7.09% uh, uh, proposed budget, significant or portion, I wouldn't say significant, 1.6% uh, is actually to fund safety initiatives, including making sure that the officers are paid fair wages and, uh, and the retention through that. That's my understanding of um, what that extra pressure is on the on the tax levy. And I asked this question during the uh, debate on the funding formula, right? That why are we not doing it together? Why policy and resources allocated to the policy should actually be coupled together? But unfortunately, our process doesn't allow. Here we are today. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, I'll stop. I have more questions, but I'll stop here and uh, maybe go to the. Uh, uh, maybe go for next, uh, but I will move the second round. Oh, we don't need, uh, did we, we haven't suspended the rules. Not yet. You yeah, not. we haven't, so I'll move the second round. Second. Please vote. Um, yes. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. Councillor Paquette, are you still in the meeting? I think we'll mark Councillor Paquette as absent. I don't see him. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that has carried. I'll pass the chair back. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Prinsby. Uh, Councillor Stevenson, go ahead, please. Uh, thank you so much. Um, maybe just briefly circling back to Explore Edmonton for one last question. Because um, I hear you with that tension in terms of there being economic impact from the events we're attracting, but not that revenue stream. I mean, I think the same is for the municipality. We don't, we don't collect that through property taxes directly. Um, just wondering if there, if it's a practice or if it's possible in terms of incorporating a service fee into the bid packages that you're creating. Um, so I'm thinking about, you know, uh, in, in a, sometimes, sometimes some of that work can be capitalized through a capital project, for example. Can the work that you do in attracting those events be billed back to the event itself? I'm thinking about that. Um, and, and maybe something to follow up on offline, because I'm sure there's lots of lots of different considerations, but just trying to, again, I think, how do we turn those into revenue streams um, to, yeah. to, to sustain the, the ongoing work? Um, but, yeah. I, yeah, I mean, I can, I, can answer that, I can answer that in a couple of ways. First of all, the board and our strategic planning is all about having sustainable, predictable budgeting and revenue streams. And mm -hmm. to ensure, you know, again, I think that it's, it's quite positive that we only require you know 20 to 25 percent from this and we've been able to i mean if you look at the bids and the events that's been yeah. remarkable and I'm, but I'm so sorry i'm just mindful of my time yeah so yeah so one example i think would be the uh the 10 million dollars from the federal government for k days mm. um and so we used that um for uh, digital and, and technical infrastructure investments at Expo Center, which means the city of Edmonton does not need to pay for that. As well, $2 million of that goes into um, improvements of the Klondike Park area at the expo exposition lands, which again aren't ours, but it's a way for another uh, investor to make improvements that we don't ask you to do. Okay, great. Uh, well, happy to follow up on that a bit further offline as well. Just want to spend a bit of time with End Poverty Edmonton. Um, so, just just a couple thoughts. So, I think I think just in terms of the the eight pillars and the eight game changers. Sorry, 
um, you know, just kind of recognizing that the ecosystem has has shifted and changed since since those were established. So I'm thinking, you know, in this in this budget, we're looking at an independent anti-racism body. Um, you know, I think the affordable housing sector. Um, there's been a lot of coalescing there. Um, you know, even just the city's own work in reconciliation and indigenization. Just wondering if part of the strategic planning has been looking at um, sort of doubling down on efforts where there are still gaps that maybe aren't being filled in the rest of the, the city. Yeah, that's 100% why we exist is to fill those gaps. So having spent a career in the social service sector, the frustration is you see the same problem over and over and over again, and it's a, it's a systemic issue. And you don't have the ability to address that issue or to work on that issue because you're just trying to keep the, the lights mm -hmm. on. You're just trying to help the person in front of you. And so the beauty of council funding an entity like this is you create an opportunity for a group of people to go work on all of those gaps, all of the coordination that may not be happening. We get to play that role. But, but I guess my question is, is if other groups have emerged to fill some of those gaps, does End Poverty Edmonton then step back from them? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's the ideal is that our community is, doesn't need an End Poverty Edmonton. So we exist because those, uh, those gaps are big. Uh, but there are networks we've created that we've now stepped away from because they're functioning well. They just needed somebody to bring them together, create a, a system for them to work. So employment uh, services is, is, okay. is something that we helped create, and now they're running. Okay. Um, and so very much looking forward to the strategic plan coming out. I think that will be, be great to look at. In terms of the early learning and care, um, so really hear the need for a strategy. I think you articulated that very clearly. I guess where I'm not understanding is why that isn't the work that M Poverty Edmonton is is doing with with your base funding, recognizing that that's one of the the main pillars. So there's the Edmonton Council for Early Learning and Care is a group that we support, um, and they've come up with recommendations. But it's crucial that the city is has its strategy, has a strategy. I think we would be working with the city to support the development of a citywide strategy, um, but really uh, the city is required to to be playing that role, or we feel that way. And I guess I'm wondering why End Poverty Edmonton isn't working on that strategy as part of the pillar, like as, uh, given that that is one of the game changers. I, I think we've, we, we've actively been working with the city to do work in this space. I think that like a city policy is something that we, that the, the council and, and End Poverty Edmonton feel is necessary. Um, but there's, there's definitely a role for the city. So we, we would be partners in developing work in this space is, is a partnership between uh, the early learning and care and Poverty Edmonton and the city. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Councilor Stevenson. Councilor Rice. Uh, thank you, Mayor Sohi. I would like to go to our Municipal Services EPL. Um, I recall last year we requested over $1 million specific for this basis expansion, but this time for this request is only about the staffing request to support original and 3,000 square feet, right? So it's not for the extension. No, this covers the expansion. It's covered for the expansion. covers the expansion to 10,000 square feet. So that is mostly comprised of additional staffing and operating requirements of that lease space. Uh, for that lease space, is, if this is just cover for FTE cost, and for other costs I heard earlier, and it's from different funding sources, not from city, right? Oh, this one is this 450 and is covered for both. The 450,000 is what we're requesting from the city of Edmonton to be able to operate in an expanded 10,000 square foot space in the Heritage Valley uh, neighborhood. Uh, is it for the staffing cost only or is it for this including spaces coverage? It covers both. I would say okay. if, you know, most of it is for staffing. However, that we need to pay the lease costs as well as utilities as well to be able to operate that space. But that is just to start from like 2025. Yes, it starts in 2025. We need assurance to be able to start negotiations with the landlord and then do the fit up the, of the space so we can open in 2025. So that means we have to approve this time. Yes, correct. And for that insurance perspective. Thank yes. you. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, so my next question go back uh, to our um, Explore Edmonton. Uh, can you tell me the in total investment, I like the point you mentioned as a shareholder where you are not asked 
the grants you're asking by estimates because we're looking at that return. Um, so can you tell me the total investment city put in in 2023 or in past three years each year? Yes. Um, in 2023 this year, yeah. in addition to the 11.7 base, you put in an additional five. In the previous two years, I can't remember the exact numbers, but it was between 20 and 22. Oh, someone's, in 2022, it was 18.7. Okay. Um, so right now, this, this request for the 10 million, um, what our Edmontonians will get for this additional 10 million? So um, in, in summary, I think it's three key components. So one is the operation of the convention center and the expo center. And so that is bringing events, conferences, uh, cultural and sporting events here, which drives economic impact to into the community, into the hotels, into restaurants, and also promotes Edmonton, Edmonton to those attendees here. Um, the other piece is uh, the remaining agricultural relationship that the city of Edmonton has to programming. So uh, the Canadian Finals Rodeo, the Urban Fair, or the Urban Farm, um, K-Days, and all of those components. Uh, okay, uh, three, <clears throat> three key components. If you didn't get this 10 million, what will happen? Right, so we would we would we would have to look at cut the fund cutting the funding of the programming. So um, in addition to what I'd named, uh, we we would have to cut the marketing and promotion and some of the sales initiatives that we have in the market now to um, both promote leisure travelers and um, and all of those events that we we bring. I would also point out, counselor, that. This is also, in our view, a way for us to activate the community and, and downtown. So we've been quite successful at bringing additional activity, which I think has a lot of benefit into our community. And I'll just use the example of CFR. That's going to happen for a week in October um, here in downtown at a time when there's really yes, not a lot sorry, going Sorry, I on. have to mind for my time. And so I just once heard marketing promotion an yeah. event attraction. But if for the event attraction, and city already invests additional few million dollars, which is approved this year earlier. So I, I don't have that number. I may uh, confirm with um, city administration. But that, that, that is a portion of the funding. It does not cover the bids. It doesn't even cover the bid costs of what we would need to attract these events, con conferences, sports, and cultural events here, nor the execution and production of it. And also to, for two sorry, facility Pastor, operation. Uh, Diane, oh, sorry, Diane my time is out. Sorry. OK, yeah. Yeah. thank con you. Yeah, Councilor Wright. Hi, thank you, Tracy. I'll stick with you here for a bit. Um, so that, that $5 million that you're getting from the Hotel Association, that's kind of on the understanding that you'll continue to be able to attract those events, right? It is, and, and, and the reason that they made the four-year commitment was they did want to indicate to City Council that they were in it as an investor. And I would, I, I would also point out, I think, it's a, I think that it's a demonstration of their confidence because that's private dollars from those hotels that are going in. And then in turn, we have to demonstrate to them that we were able to bring in events, conferences, or people that fill those room nights. Okay. And then... And then, and you, you mentioned already about how it does, you know, create the vibrancy in the downtown and that. Is there any investment like through Downtown Business Association or Chamber of Commerce in that as well, partnerships going there? Yes, and I would say, I mean, we, we really work collaboratively with that. I'm, I'm using CFR because it's the latest bid that we received. But, you know, again, that the, the cost of that bid and production is in the millions. And we had support from a number of entities, everyone from the airport um, to, you know, the other, the other funders that I've named and also corporate um, funders. So we, we, we leverage the dollars that you put in. I, and I think that's a key for us. 
you know, when you when you provide a dollar, um, we we've been able to generate another six dollars just for the bid, and the economic impact of those, of course, is far greater to the businesses that support uh, tourism in our city. But any direct investment, I'm, I'm just referring. I think Councillor Jans had mentioned about we've been asked to, you know, cut back on anything but core services, um, and that's from the business community. So I want to know if the business community is rallying to invest. Oh, thank you for that. Yes, absolutely. So I'll just again stick with the CFR as an example. Um, the, we had a group of uh, private businesses that came to us ahead of the bid and said, we will fundraise on our own. And that is a portion of what we use to be able to secure the bid and be able to promote the event. So again, that that was private business that, um, that on their own got together to start fundraising to be able to bring that event back. As well, you know, I know we had the discussion, but a number of the events that you have attended, I think about another example, the Heritage Classic uh, events, uh, those, those, uh, some of the additional events that we produce around that, same with Junos, are funded by, by private investors and private companies. Okay, that's good to know. Um, um, Eric, I'm just wondering, um, early learning, does that kind of fall under um, the Provincial Children's Services? Ministry and and do you get any funding from them? Uh, it does and we don't. There's a federal provincial agreement uh, that's been put in place, and the, the goal is to have ten dollar daycare for across the city. Okay, sorry, but you said it does fall under community uh, or child, or child under and family, child and family services, but you don't get any direct funding. Correct. Okay, that's unfortunate. Um, Don, um, so. The funding that you're looking for is to improve the service, food service lines. You said, you mentioned walkers. Um, like provincial aids to daily living can provide walkers with seats and I've, I've been in a number of long-term care facilities that where everybody's got their walker with the seat um, and that they can put their food tray down. I mean, is that something that the province can make sure that people have? Uh, no, I, I may have misspoke, Councillor. Um, the, the idea there is to having staff there supporting our, our residents through those processes. Walkers and stuff, I think, uh, and uh, equipment is, is taken care of. This is about supporting our people directly, our residents directly. Okay, um, next quick fire question was going to be for, oh my goodness. Oh, um, I'll go back to the police commissioner, the police service, just um, Mayor So he'd mentioned about um, enforcing the noise bylaw. Um, recently, there's been concerns in Southeast Edmonton in regards to Diwali celebrations. And I'm just wondering what are the parameters around um, noise enforcement and, and attending to those events? You know, policing is always trying to strike a balance. So of course, the Canadian Charter expressly protects freedom of religion, freedom of expression. And we obviously want there to be vibrancy in Edmonton and for groups to feel <clears throat> uh, the ability to celebrate. Of course, the offsetting side of that is that, you know, Edmontonians also want to live without noise, particularly late into the evening. So most of the time, our SOP or our standard operating procedures as a police service uh, seeks to strike a balance to allow people this freedom to express themselves while also respecting the uh, the rights of their neighbors to not have noise through the evening. Okay. So you thank thank you, Constable. Right, Constable Tang. Was like, should I pick up on that? Um, maybe I won't. Um, I guess just to continue some of the other questions um, posed to the other ABCs, wondering if the commission can speak to. OP12 or similar kinds of efforts um, undergoing uh, in your organization in terms, you know, I, I hear you in terms of the challenge of hiring, but you do have funds to hire. Um, what are some efforts underway in terms of um, savings or reallocating resources towards the front line, um, matching efforts similar underway at the city? The, the largest investment reinvestment into frontline policing occurred, I think, uh, before OP12, but we have moved from having eight squads uh, per patrol branch to having 10 squads per patrol branch. That was part of your vision 
2020? That came after Vision 2020. Uh, Vision 2020 acknowledged that we needed to make sure that we had a great presence in the community. This was based on a, a, quite a sophisticated study done by our accelerator branch, our research branch. And uh, fundamentally, during business hours, when people are waking up, they're reporting more crime, break and enter to residents, for example, or a detached garage. Coupled with that is an enhanced requirement for court time of police officers. So we found that there was a particular pressure during day shifts. So what we have now is we have a static day shift so that we have the ability to be out in the communities more at peak times where calls for service are coming in. Not necessarily peak crime times, but peak times where uh, where we need to have police officers attend at calls for service. Right, I think I, think I do recall yeah. um, discussions about kind of changing the squad model. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to be mindful of time, so I know I appreciate that. The chief wants to respond to your question. Okay. <laughs> yeah, there, there's as uh, Justin has mentioned, there's several of those. Uh, Ten squad model was a demand from the public to actually put more people in the streets, uh, at front lines. We've done the same thing with GST gang suppression. We've done the thing, same thing as non-fatal shooting teams. All those resources are coming from internally to move things around to meet the priorities. This is something that we've done. I don't know how many off reviews have we done? Several. Uh, we do this regular course of business to actually deploy our resources and to change our uh, personnel to get as many out as we can. On okay, so it's part of the ongoing, correct? On, ongoing review exercise. Um, I guess you know. Uh, I know you know. Questions about audit has come up in the past um, from a commission perspective. When was the last time you've done one? Can you just remind me? Oh. Service uh, commission. You, you're asking for an audit on our deployment yep. or any audit? Any audit on your your budget. That would that I see is a commission role. Is that? Uh, thank you, Councillor. So last year the commission engaged in a fairly lengthy process. As last they, year, just last, last year? year. Yeah. So it wasn't an audit per se, but it was many many hours and meetings doing deep dives on the services budget so that the commissioners could understand what was in the current budget. Uh, they leveraged two consultants last year, you may recall, to get input from the public to help inform them what citizens' perspectives were in that budget. Then they spent three full days in the summer learning what the current budget is, where it's spent, how it's allocated, how the flow through goes. And based off those conversations and those input points from the public, they met with the service through August and September and October to refine and submit what the budget package you saw last year, uh, that they put before you last year. Okay, so this is to inform budget development process. And, and to get a deep, deep understanding of, of the, uh, the, the layout of the budget, which divisions are funded, which ways uh, to understand, uh, you know, the, the relationship between 82% personnel, 18% non-personnel costs. It was three full days going through division by division where the money goes, where the uh, staffing and resources are allocated. And what you're getting for the money, but it's not a formal. Not a formal audit. Okay, but that that hasn't been done for a while, I guess, is uh, what no. I'm asking. Okay. Um, okay, just a quick switch gear on one item. Um, and just to confirm, for the for, for the for all the help profiles that I saw, that is a provincial grant, correct? Correct. And then can you remind me the total? The, the total of the provincial grant is $15 million over three years. Some of it's reflected in this. Some of which is, yeah. and then has some of that already been spent too? Okay, you have. Okay, great. And then this is three years from 2023 then until 2025? Correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Councillor Jans. Thank you. Um, to the commission, um, during the last few years, the city administration has uh, implemented controls around travel, hospitality, other expenses. I was wondering if could the commission comment on on that? So, could I just ask you to be a little bit more specific in terms of what you're asking for around travel or hospitality? What controls does the commission have around travel? So, from Anything that's operational that the, that the service does to take on to, to go to conferences or to do training and learn more skill sets, you know, that's all covered through the budget that's allocated by the city council and then, like we said, reviewed by the commission. Um, but those are operational decisions that we trust our 
chief of police and his senior management to make, um, and we haven't seen anything that has been inordinate. Um, I don't know if Matt wants to add, but um, from our perspective, all of that spending has been um, in, in accordance with the roles and the functions of what the service needs to would, do. Would you describe it as consistent with the city of Edmonton, or like I'm wondering about the benchmarking? I'm not familiar with city of Edmonton spend on travel and um, attending conferences and like that I, kind of thing. I know of one example. There was like the city of Edmonton sent one individual to a conference, but the I believe the service sent three or other. It depends it, on the conference. It depends on the topic. So, for example, if it's a governance conference, then obviously, you know, a bunch of commissioners will go, and there won't be as uh, a bigger group of the service going. If it's a if it's a conference that's specifically related to the police service, um, then you know we won't attend necessarily, but they will send the the appropriate people um, that need to be at those conferences and um, can benefit from the learning and the professional aspects of the job. I was interested in fleet runtime as well too. You know, I, I when I'm out of town and I see RCMP vehicles, they're significantly older than the kinds of vehicles I see in Edmonton. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to answer that. So to, to your first question to the commission, 0.7% of the Edmonton police spend is on travel and training. That includes mandatory training for our specialized areas, the Canadian Police College. So once again, that's 0.7. Four, four million, six million? 3.3. 3. Four million, yeah. So yeah, 3.3 3. 3. 3. 3, yeah. is, is what it is. And again, that includes K-9 forensics, flight operations, tactical, our 911 center homicide, amongst others. Uh, when it comes to your question about fleet. Sorry, um, maybe we can stay there for a minute. So 3.3 3 million, uh, 2,000 frontline members, um, 6,000 FTE overall. Is it a small group of people having to do a lot of travel or, I mean, I'm going to get my calculator here, but how? Well, we're not, we're not sending everyone out of town uh, always. Yeah. Uh, naturally, there's going to be some courses that we can teach and manage in-house, but there's going to be some people that are leaving and travel and training is not just travel. It is also training courses that are not included with, you know, out of town visits. Okay. Okay. Like we've worked on, am I still going? We've worked on bringing a lot more things in house too. So yeah. I don't know. It's sometimes the optics or the considerations of that. We we just hosted our own conference for exactly that reason. Less than one percent is far below the the industry standard for policing. Uh, it's something that we monitor all the time, as the commissioner the chair has said or vice chair has said. Each one of these gets looked at individually. Of course, yeah, and and I imagine it's signed off by the chief or a deputy. Or yeah. yeah. Um, I don't doubt there's process. I don't doubt there's that. I just wonder, and I believe that constant the conference that was recently hosted here was paid for by the foundation, not not the service. Yeah, I see a nod from the chief for those watching at home. Um, okay, sorry. Back to the vehicle runtime. Yeah. So for fleet, uh, we have a cost per kilometer to operate our fleet. So in year one, it costs ten cents to operate fleet. In year six, it cost 76 cents per kilometer to operate fleet. The average patrol vehicle at EPS puts on just over 25,000 kilometers a year. So in the sixth year of the marked vehicles that you see running, it costs $19,000 a year to run them and it goes up exponentially after that. So that is the reason why we have come to uh, the length that we use fleet for. It's either six years or 160,000 kilometers for our marked patrol fleet, because after that it becomes prohibitively expensive to keep them on the road. Uh, we're better off. But I, yet the RCMP do, Calgary does, Winnipeg does, like other. Well, I don't know if that's no? true, Councilor Johns. I don't know if Calgary and Winnipeg do divest themselves of their vehicles later than we do. Yeah. And this is done based on the you know the prevailing costs that will. I mean, we ha we still have an asset when we get rid of it, right? So we take it to auction as all divesting of city assets has to go. And when you're paying $20,000 a year to run a vehicle, uh, it starts to become, you know, m more cost to keep it on the road than to have a vehicle that costs far less to maintain. I, I don't doubt that. I'm just wondering how we... I oh, am I'm sorry. Sorry. Councillor Principe, can you take this chair, please? 
Sure, I'll take the chair. Yeah, I, you know, this is this is my eleventh municipal budget, and this is the most difficult. Uh, so, I want to start with you, uh, uh, Tracy. Trying to balance investing into core services, which this budget does, at the same time recognizing the important work and how critical it is for economic growth, attraction, and everything else that a good city should have, the work you're doing. I'm just thinking aloud and trying to figure out like how to, how to continue to support you, right? And uh, at the same time being very mindful where the, the tax pressures are. Are there ways for you to, I know it's hard, uh, you know, make do with what you have, right? And then we fig try to figure out maybe next year, and uh, then as things maybe improve and inflationary pressures are, are lessened. Uh. Yeah, I mean, I would say that the board and management, I mean, we, we understand that. Yeah. Um, and um, I just don't, I mean, if we could come here with a different answer, we would mm -hmm. rather come here with a different answer. Mm -hmm. I think there's a significant efficiency in having all of those entities integrated under Explore. It didn't, it didn't cost uh, the additional money that it would, um, that it did independently. And- Oh, I'm, our, not, I'm not questioning those. I'm just, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big supporter of what you do. And I, you add so much value, and your leadership is phenomenal, right? So uh, I'm just trying to figure out what is this some of the maybe smoothing opportunities or bridging opportunities that exist until we are in a better position to uh, 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 financially as a municipality to look at supporting. Uh, that's you and library and <laughs> and GEF and yep. and poverty. Yeah, I mean, and I don't, I don't have a great answer for that. I, I would say we, you did ask us for that yes. in 2023, and we did spend like fully, fully our reserves, which mm -hmm. means we're, we're not even keeping up on our annual maintenance of the Expo Center and the Convention Center, which is again planned for next year within this, within this budget. But it does mean, you know, again, over time, we become less competitive. We have, just mm. using those as examples, we have new convention centers coming online in Regina, Calgary, and other communities. You are aware, as well, that we are trying to look for other private partners to make investments in there that supports even more of the burden being carried outside of the city. Mm. Um, so, you know, if we would just have to make decisions on. Okay. No, I, I understand that. Uh, maybe to uh, Don, I don't remember if we ever funded positions or personnel with GEF. We have dealt with deficits that the organization and that we are obligated to do so. Mm -hmm. Have we ever funded positions through municipality? I'll ask uh, Shanaika Donalds yeah. to come and speak and, uh, to that. That's coupled, before my turn. Coupled with that question is, uh, why would province not be funding this? Because looking after seniors, uh, housing and care is primarily the provincial responsibility. I can provide a supplemental to that after uh, okay. Dr. Uh, Shanaika okay. Donald. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the funding that, go, that the city has provided over the years has been part of our operating. So it does help to support um, staffing as well as other areas of the lodge program. Yeah. Um, what we do, what we're faced with is that we've had a staffing model that has existed for actually closer to 20 years where our clan population has changed significantly. And when we look across, we have 11 lodges, and so we have a fact, a scalability um, issue. And so when we look across the lodges, what we're delivering in terms of support to these vulnerable older adults, yeah. there is um, inconsistencies in the service. So when we look at the staffing that we're talking about, it's about four FTE per lodge. Yeah, maybe quickly on, on, on the province. I want 20 seconds left. We live in a complex structure, uh, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, we 
we operate under a provincial mandate under the Housing Act in a duality of accountability between the province and the city. Hmm. We don't determine social policy. We just do our damnedest to deliver it. Yeah. And we represent an unheard population. Yeah. Okay. Right now, we're not asking for more. We're asking just to maintain human dignity in our facilities. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'll take the chair back, and I'll go to Councillor Cart now. Great, thank you. I feel like we might. this might be a bit of a circular thing, but I just wanted to go back then to uh, to explore and explore Edmonton. So just on the venues, from a venues perspective, if we don't have the dollars that attract the events, then there's fewer events. If there's fewer events, then there's fewer people coming to the buildings and paying admissions and paying fees and putting on shows and effectively putting money in the pocket of Explorer to operate those buildings. But those buildings don't go away. The heating bill still has to be paid. The roof still has to be maintained. There still has to be people, a, a staff complement that is on standby for the events that do come. Fair? That's true. So every piece of business we get improves the margin. And the other comment I would make is, um, I mean, you've seen in our OP12 submission, we've made cuts. We've reduced staffing. Most of our staffing comes from those two venues. But we've reduced the cost of staffing. But these bids also take years to secure. So, I mean, the work that we're doing now is actually the work that's going to deliver the returns in year two, three, four, five. Um, so I also worry that a decrease in investment means we're actually deferring um, negative impacts, not, not just here in the venues currently, but in future years. Now, the city is in the midst of... of a roughly 85 to $90 million uh, upgrade of the mechanical systems at Expo. So the city is making that investment on the presumption, I would say, that that building is going to be active and things are going to happen in it. Fair? Can you, maybe I'll ask you this, can you speak to the venues that we compete with in Western Canada? You know, you alluded to some of the other cities that have things coming on board. They have more space, they, I, I'm guessing they have uh, more modern venues, I'm guessing, but there's also some table stakes conversations around uh, environmental awareness, ecological responsibility, those kinds of things, yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'd say, I mean, if we think about our competitive differentiators, because you know we have a lot of new facilities coming on across Canada that are bigger or fancier, but we have to look at what our competitive differentiators are. And I think we do have those, and we, we are proud of those. The Expo Centre is one of them. The scale of that in Western Canada is a differentiator for us, and you know we want to leverage that, and we have been able to get more business in there. Um, so I think that's an opportunity. The other piece I would say is we, we align, you know, you invest 25%, we align 100% of our programming into city plans. So sustainability is a significant pillar for us, not just within those facilities and energy, for example, or CO2, but in our sustainable events program. So one of the differentiators that we have in Edmonton, and I think it's really important for our brand internationally, is our things like our sustainable events program. So we, we can, it's, it's maybe not as popular in Canada or the US yet, but it is, it is important in international markets for big convention producers to see that they can put their event in a community, in a convention center that offers them a net zero event, for example, and also the opportunity to make investments in social programs. And that is a program that we, that we sell internationally that I think also supports our brand. Uh, I'm going to go back to the venue piece for just a minute more. So, and I don't know that you'll have the answer of the, to this at your fingertips, but if we go back several years, uh, EEDC operated the convention center and had several other areas of business. I, I don't know if in during that time if the convention center broke even on its discrete operations or if other things, uh, other lines of service subsidized it. And when we go to the Expo Center, in the expanded Expo Center, in its, when that building was built, it was part of Northlands, and Northlands was running an arena, and that arena subsidized virtually every other operation in the organization and on the site. I don't, you know, so the evolution from then to here has been rough. 
uh, EEDC has taken on a new venue but has had a, a, a performance venue, a coliseum uh, taken out of it. Has there been really an opportunity to optimize and understand and realize just what those venues really need to operate as discrete venues? Yeah, I think there's pluses and minuses. I'm going to talk quickly. First of all, COVID was a significant challenge for us. Now, on the positive side, having, like I said, our finance, our, our HR, even being able to job share, you know, with our chefs across the different venues provides, like, operational efficiency. So on the cost side, um, that's certainly a positive. And I think over time, thinking about both Expo and the Convention Centre as an integrated system is also um, an opportunity for us. But, um, you know, it's... Generally, these do not break even in other in other markets. That's why they're owned and operated by the city. We think that we can improve the margin as Explore Edmonton, and we've done that, and we'll, that will continue to be uh, the target for us in future years. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Cartmel. Can you move the additional round? Uh, yes, I'll move another round. Okay. Second. Second by Councillor Nack. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Councilor Jans. <clears throat> yeah, uh, just wanted to go back to, so to GEF, um, does AHS not pay for staffing, like aides, personal attendants, care attendants, et cetera? They absolutely do. And, and that's, a, that's outside of our service. We contract with them to provide that service. We're talking about the service within the residence. We don't deal with that service. So AHS does not pay for anyone in your residence? I'm going to ask Shanaika to answer that so specifically. So AHS provides home care services to clients in the building. That is organized between the clients and the um, and AHS because it is considered congregate living, not long-term care. So because of it, it looks and operates differently. Right. So there are health care <laughs> services in there. They're just not GEFs and lodges by the structure that they operate under are not required to deliver home care. No, lodges are supposed to be independent living, right? Independent li with su supportive living, with housekeeping, food services, um, in them and activities. So that's under the um, the mandate. That's what we're supposed to be delivering. Okay, that again, I I would I'd be interested. Like, would or what advocacy has been done to AHS or to the government to 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 provide for more of these needs? More of the needs of the clients. Uh, as so I heard, the clients have expressed they want these services. How have we directed that appropriately to Minister Lagrange? So I should I should clarify and pro potentially provide an explanation about the services. So housekeeping, for example, is one of the services that we're required to provide as lodge operators. We have we have over the years, for example, not provided housekeeping on a statutory holiday to folks. We don't have any housekeepers um, on a weekend to help with. Um, any issues that may come up. One of the things that we've seen over the last five years is that our clients are coming to us older and um, with more comorbidities. And so that is affecting, for example, incontinence is a major issue. Um, Alberta Health Services does provide supports for some of that. So they will um, help with persons accessing products and home care services around bathing and so on. But when someone has an accident on a Sunday at one o'clock in the dining room, that's our staff. If we don't have housekeeping there, we're talking about potentially a food service staff, which we really don't want to have happen. That's concerning AHS doesn't support people seven days a week. They do support them seven days a week, but it is for the lines of service that they're approved. So if I'm approved for bath, medication, um, wound care, I get those lines of services. But if I, because they are not in the lodge 24 seven, if something happens- That's even happens, more concerning how limiting that is. I, I guess I'll never ever grow old. <laughs> I guess we I'll, all hope, we yeah, all Yeah, wow, hope. wow. Yes. Yeah, thank you for sharing that today. Um, I wanted to, to jump back to um, just the piece around, so as I see there's uh, to, the, to the service or the commission, I guess, the, 
There's 600000 in capital to purchase new vehicles for the help team. There's six new help teams. I'm assuming that's a $100,000 vehicle per help team. Is that right? I will look. I think that, that sounds appropriate, although I'm not sure that... And usually I'm, when I see them, they're the new pickup trucks. Is that... Uh, help has SUVs and trucks. Yeah. yeah. Any thought to more compact or fuel efficient or smaller vehicles? Well, I don't think that fuel is necessarily driving the bottom line. Ford is part of the fleet of vehicles that make sort of police rated vehicles right now. So there's quite a bit of equipment that ends up going into police vehicles when you consider the computer and the safety equipment that goes in there. So in fact, we have a member experience uh, police officer whose job it is to make sure that the vehicles are ergonomic. You know, if we're going to have police officers in them for 11 hours a day, we need to make sure that it's sufficient to carry all of the equipment that they're expected to carry. 11 hour shifts are common? Uh, in patrol they are. I'm not an expert on how help deploys, but they are, uh, sir, that is their mobile office, right? That is them and, and the the social worker or the navigator that they ride with, that is their mobile office. I'm sorry, I'm out of time again. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jans. Councillor Wright. Hi, thank you. Pilar, I didn't ask you about the, the provincial funding. You had said that it's it's typical for about 5% of your funding to come from the province? Yes. Okay, and is that, sorry, is that typical across other municipalities? it is 8%. Cody's just correcting me. Okay, yes. Yes. <laughs> thank you, Cody. Um, and is that, is that sort of standard across other municipalities in the province? It's, it's standard, typical for uh, municipal libraries like Calgary and Edmonton, Lethbridge. Yes, it would be. And I just want to clarify, we're not going to let the province off the hook for um, upping their grant to provide the 2023-2024 population figures. Um, so that is a continued advocacy effort that we will pursue. Okay. Okay, perfect. Good. And let's see, getting back to Dawn. Oh, um, or do you want to come back up to the mic? <laughs> I, I, and I don't know who can address this. So um, is too much being, I guess, maybe downloaded at the supportive living level that maybe somebody with more complex needs should be um, better suited for a long-term care facility? That is a very complex question <laughs> to answer, and I don't know that uh, I I don't know that it would be fair. I could give a fair enough um, assessment across the system. I will say that there is room for more work to be done across health and um, housing providers to better support the clients in different spaces. Um, whether it is too much that's happening where people, um, if they should be in long-term care, if that's what we need, I don't think that I'm in a position to fully address that part. Okay, and the long-term care, are, are there, is there space available? Like if, if you were to assess, because I think everything's done through the Bad Hub, right? Yes. Okay. And that's HS, which we have no line of sight into. Okay. So you don't know, like, if there is any... Any, any room if you were to have to put somebody into or, or recommend long term? So I, I would say that a lot of, there are a lot of intervening variables when we talk about people moving on. Um, it is, uh, we need to look at what supports can happen in the community because we, there is a big international push for aging in place. And so there, we, we then need to determine what then becomes the right place for aging, is it a long-term care space, a lodge? And so it, it is a very complex um, space. I will say that we do work in partnership with Alberta Health Services to ensure that clients are in the spaces that is best supporting their needs. Okay, and will that be simplified with the restructuring of AHS, do you think? Oh. <laughs> okay, that answers that question. Thank that's you very not, much. That's not something I can answer. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, I'll go back to the Police Commission because that seems to be an easier line of questioning. No. Um, I, okay, I guess one of my pet peeves is Enterprise Commons. Um, I do notice a comment um, in the report from the, the Commission meeting um, that it, you didn't receive funding 
um, uh, I guess, when the city decided that you needed to, 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 to come in line. Um, but I do recall a three million ask in 2021 uh, for, which included EPL and, and EPS for um, subject matter experts. To my, <clears throat> to my knowledge, we have not yet been in front of council asking for money on the Enterprise Commons project. Okay, well this was, it was an unfunded package in 2021. Um, so, Pilar, do you remember that? <laughs> no? Okay, okay, I'll go back to my other notes. Um, but then, but you're looking at a deficit coming up in 2024, I think, as well. We have... Uh, 2.438 million? Yeah, we have capital dollars that we're investing into this uh, to support the program because it's coming, Kay. as you say. And so we are trying to determine how to be good partners to make sure that the police service is ready to embrace the suite of programs that come with Enterprise Commons. Kay while also balancing the financial obligations that come with that. Okay, because you've, in, yeah, you've indicated in the report here a project overspend of 2.438, so you're looking to cover that within existing budget, is that right? Well, we are, we are speaking to the police commission of how we may be able to address that. Uh, and it's also predicated on the amount of time that we're currently expecting before go live, so we're trying to figure out how we'll approach that anticipated overspend from, from capital. Okay. I look forward to seeing that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wright. So we will take a break here now, and we'll be back. Maybe, let's do it back at 3.50 for sure, please, everyone. Uh, and uh, until then, we are on the recess. Okay.
Oops. Okay, I would like to call this meeting back to order. And we'll start with the roll call of council colleagues. Councillor Wright. Good afternoon. Councillor Knack. Good afternoon. Councillor Principe. Hello. Councillor Stevenson. Good afternoon. Councillor Paquette. Uh, Councillor Tang. Hello. Councillor Hamilton. Councillor Rutherford. Good afternoon. Councillor Salvador. Good afternoon. Councillor Cartmel. Good afternoon. Councillor Reyes. Hello, here. And Councillor Jans. Good afternoon. Okay, next in the line is Councillor Rice. Go ahead, please. Uh, thank you, Mayor Solhi. So, I want to go to EPC. Um, on the comments, and the mayor, so he mentioned is at 1.6%. Um, so I just want to make, make sure my understanding is correct. And because um, in salary settlement for the $90 million, that's just, just part of the city's $43 million salary settlement. That is not increase. So that is not increase. That is my understanding, right? So, yeah, for the $19 million, $19 million for the salary attribution statement, that is just part of city's $43 million Council salary. Rice, yeah, yeah. The, the large number is not one that we are necessarily familiar with. Yeah. The Edmonton Police Service salary settlements was in that yeah. $19 million number. Yes, yeah. that is not increased. That is just attribution and for the salary and wage settlement and for the starting from 2019 and to 2023 for that. Correct. Five years. I just want to clarify and to have that clarification on the record that is not increased. Um, so the another six, uh, another point six percent is just uh, generated from the funding formula. That's all. Is not the additional increase. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Um, then I'm, my next question going to um, next question going to the explore and Tracy was stuck on you today, and then we know the how important the uh, economic traf, uh, drive and this organization and provided it to our city. Um, I just wondering uh, because I come I clarified at the beginning and then for the two facilities. For the capital maintenance is not part of this request, and also is not part of your ongoing funding. That is uh, covered by our city's capital uh, or under operational um, expenditures. So I just wonder, how did you calculate to this ten million for this amount? Sorry, Councillor, how did how do I calculate yeah. the venue Why? needs? Yeah, so this 10 million, yeah. this 10 million right. you request. Yeah, yeah. so um, the, I mean, the 10 million is broken out across all of those different components that I've talked about. Um, the, the two venues don't entirely break even. And the point I'm trying to make on the venues is in addition to that, because we've used all of our reserves, there are a number of... Um, investments that we continue to defer. So the, my comments around the venues are trying to demonstrate the fiscal restraint um, that we're trying to demonstrate for the city. So if we, we try to demonstrate physical restraints, and that's his, I think that is the effort we are doing right now here. And then what is the minimum amount do you think? Because right now you, this is not reduce this is actually increase and to keep the current level and your operational level your service level your program level and you request this 10 million and i'm wondering and then for example 2023 and with the, with how much money you have i almost close to like over 60 million dollars and an average is like 80 million dollars per year and with that money, you keep what you're doing right now. And so let me try to say it a different way. So you, what's the minimal number? What's the minimal? If, like ten, if we talk about the physical constraints, we try to implement that principle during this budget deliberation. 
What's a minimum number? And you think could be meet the goal you are talking about, like scope extension and your mandate to be met. Right. So the so my first comment is we're not asking for. I mean, we are not going to be spending more. Um, we put we have we have applied five million dollars of our reserves in 2023 to be able to continue to implement the programming, but we won't have those five million dollars in reserves next year. So it's the same it's the same ask of council to maintain the programming that we have. We're not asking to expand programming. Um, in terms of and in terms of the cost cutting, I know you've seen the the OP12. So um, to manage the increased costs of everything, like in inflation, for example, um, we have done things like uh, hedging uh, for our investments in energy. We have done things like uh, reduce our staffing costs. We've deferred. Uh, upper upper management hires for for example those are the things that we've done to mitigate the significant impacts on inflation considering we have those two venues thank, thank you thank you I got my information from your answer thanks thank you Councillor Reyes Councillor Salvador yeah thanks so much um, uh, sorry you're sticking with with Explore as well um, you know you're you're mentioning potential reductions to programming and I guess one of the things that I concerned about and worried about is just ability to leverage partnered funding as well and how that how would that be impacted? Yeah, I think that's the most for, for us that's the most important point. So for every dollar you provide to us, we go get six other dollars from other orders of government or the private sector to be able to attract and get those events here. In addition, for every dollar we invest, there's 12 in economic impact. So, you know, when we remove a dollar from the city investment, we remove all of that leveraged funding. And I would also, you know, tie this back to Councillor Jan's questions. I know that, um, that you as a municipality are working with other orders of government around appropriate funding. But in addition to that, I think we're, we're an entity that could that can go get additional funding based on projects delivered into our city. So, I, you know, I've used some examples of events. Another example that I will use is we work really closely with Travel Alberta and Prairies Can, the federal government, and we work with local small tour operators to help them. This was something the mayor asked us to do a couple of years ago. It wasn't just the amount of money we were getting into our entity, but how could we help those small, medium-sized businesses? So, you know, there's a bike tour operator, for example. Um, we worked with them to get Prairies Can federal funding, and that has enabled Vanessa to expand that bike tour out significantly, buy additional bikes, and, and provide additional services for Eventonians and visitors, and is a direct impact on her small business. Okay, that's that's helpful. And I guess when I think about pursuing various bids and looking to attract um, different events, like what? What degree of certainty and predictability do you need in order to just engage in that process, I guess? Because it sounds like there's a fair amount of lead time and planning that's required in order to simply have a shot at, at those opportunities. Yeah, it depends. So I think there's there's two two reasons we need certainty of um, that, that first dollar. One is because you know, the province and the federal government want to see that the, they, that's the first question they ask, is, are, is the city invested in it? Um, and so we need to be able to answer that, that the city is. And often we need to get those funds committed by the different orders of government and private investors, investors before we can go to the market and even compete for the bid. You don't want to compete for a bid and not have the investment to do it. That's, you know, obviously doesn't work from a reputational perspective. Um, in addition, um, many many of these major conferences that we that we bring in or events they just they they take years. So if you think about the Junos, for example, if you think about you know CCMAs that we're familiar with, and then the business events that we're bringing in, 
the, the, they they take years to develop. That's what our that's what our sales team um, does. And and often there may be a technical reason they they don't put it in Edmonton. Maybe they're looking for a different part of the world. But we keep developing that sales relationship so that we get that we get that event here committed. You know, in three years time. And as I've said, a real focus for us is also those repetitive ongoing bids. So there's an efficiency in bringing an event back that's annual. Okay, that's helpful. Uh, that's all for me. Thank you, Council Salvador. Councillor Principe, can you take the chair? I'll Just the uh, chair. have one last question to uh, to Pilar. I was intrigued by your comment about that province or going to the province for uh, uh, making sure that the population growth that we're experiencing, the uh, per capita support from from the province goes up. When does that get adjusted? Does it that get what? It, what during the budget or? Normally during the budget, however, there's no, they just decide when they decide. However, mm -hmm. we, we had been advocating with Calgary Public Library and other libraries across the province. Yeah. So I think that definitely spurred the latest increase and we have plans, we are we're meeting, we have meetings already this year to okay. continue that advocacy effort, but they don't, they don't annually adjust it. They, okay. The last adjustment was in 2016. So there was last one in 2016. Before this latest one in 2022. Okay, I see. Okay, uh, is it for sixteen dollars per person, or like, or what is the amount? I would have to defer to Cody on that. Five dollars and sixty cents per capita. Oh, I thought that was I thought it was sixteen. I wish it was sixteen. I wish it was sixteen. <laughs> 16. Uh, okay. Then I appreciate that you reduced the ask from more than a million to 450. Because uh, I'm kind of thinking that maybe is there like, and you need to know by 20, like when, when would you need to know in 2024? We need to know by the end of this year so we can solidify the lease with the landlord and start the fit up process, which would take about eight to 12 months. Oh, I see. So you can't wait till February budget to see cause then if that doesn't materialize. Not for huh? us to be able to um, execute in 2025. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. And I will take the chair back. Uh, so that concludes the questions to uh, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, for coming and uh, and joining us. Uh, you know, uh, it's uh, uh, we appreciate really, uh, really, really appreciate the work that everyone uh, is doing in uh, in your respective organizations and agencies. So we deeply appreciate that. So, thank you. Yeah, we will deliberate on the budget, and we'll try to figure things out. If can't. It, can't doesn't mean doesn't mean that we don't value your work, right? So thank you. Yeah. Okay, all right. So while everyone is leaving, uh, you know, if, uh, if you haven't got the chance to look at administration's presentation, so everyone, if I grab your attention for one thir 30 seconds, uh, you know, if you haven't got a chance to look at administration's presentation from this morning, uh, please do have a look at it. It's a very well done presentation on uh, how the resources are being allocated, where the tax levy is going, and how much Edmontonians are paying per uh, per day uh, to run our corporation, right? So very well done presentation from administration, a lot of good information. So it'll be helpful for your communications purposes as well. So look, it was this morning. I'm pretty sure Andre can share that with the agencies. It is yes, also at edmonton.ca backslash meetings. If you yeah. just go into the November 21st, it will be attached there. Okay, great. Good. Thank you.
Okay, questions to administration. Uh, yep, questions to administration. All right. We've got 50 minutes. Constant Jans. Thank you. Uh, I was just interested in if the city manager could clarify what are our policies re re uh, related to travel in, in the city corporate? Yeah, so uh, essentially travel is authorized for uh, deemed requirements of work. Um, we uh, don't do any business class travel or any, um, um, any higher than economy. From time to time, there are exceptions uh, if there's an abilities uh, issue with individual employees, but I don't think that's happened since I've been here. Uh, and we travel economy everywhere that we go if necessary. Since OP12 was implemented, we have uh, constrained travel in the city. And now any travel within the province can be approved by a DCM and any travel outside the province must be approved by the city manager. And what I've noticed is a great reduction as a result of that, people are just uh, understanding that it's it's only if it's absolutely essential to do. And then one of the things we've had some success with is we've actually denied travel to conferences, um, but then found out that the conference organizers wanted our expertise so much that they offered to pay for the travel. Uh, we had a couple of trips to Europe and, and uh, like that. And so bec because at that point we'd only be paying for meals, we approved the travel, uh, at, 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 but it was only a small cost to the city of Edmonton. So I think all those OP12 steps are, are helping us with our travel limitations and, and we've reported on some of the constraints and how they've resulted in some OP12 savings. Yeah, and whenever we can bring experts into Edmonton, that's excellent because everybody benefits. Um, just curious though, if we had a ballpark figure, I think the police said 3.3 .3 million. Do we know what we'd be looking at as a corporate? Uh, so we just did some quick calculations and we are at 3.4 million. Uh, the bulk of it though would be training, not travel. Okay, so travel would be within that 3.4 million? That's correct. It's, uh, so it's, it's almost understand? 3 million in training and um, about, it's so it's 520,000 in travel. Okay. That's, and yeah. almost three million in training, and that's for 2023. Okay, excellent. And that's maybe all. if I could just give one example of, of an important travel that's not associated with training and other things, and it's when we are in big procurements. So when we're about to take possession of a new bus or an LRV, for example, I want our folks to go verify on the ground before we sign for those things. Uh, it often happens with fire trucks and things like that. We want people to on ground verified before we sign for the, the capital. Of course, yeah. Uh, and so that's a, just a good example of, I yeah. think, taking care of why we would travel to take care of our interests. I think five, 520,000 in a, a, a year for a city with ten, you know thousands of employees of this size, I think is an absolutely acceptable figure. I would have no problem there um, for us at least. What's that? Uh, I guess my next question, so I'm really struggling with what I heard from GF. That was shocking to me. Um, the abdication of, of well, the, how how did we get here? Uh, was this is this has been the the city pulling back services over years, or is this like what I'm hearing all of this this from the speakers today that that is healthcare work? Um, have we been like I'm I'm new here. I'm two years in and I'm still learning, but like. Why, why, are, why are we being asked to pay for so many of those things that are basic dignity and yeah, like what was being shared? Like have we, re I guess what I'm trying to get to, have we reduced funding? Has the province reduced funding? Has the service level gone down? What, was this a pandemic measure that we're being asked to? I don't think we have the answer to that question readily available. Councillor, so I think we can certainly go back and maybe do some work on that and try to get you an answer during the budget process, but I, I just, we don't have anybody here who knows. Well, that. I guess what I would say is, like, we only, we're only required to fund the deficit mm -hmm. when they incur the deficit, and the rest of this would be 
they make a budgetary ask and we decide if we want to. I just, I'm not sure I can answer the question about how did we, how did we get to that level of service and is that our fault? Okay, so we have not cut staffing. We don't determine their staffing. I, I don't believe we've ever made a cut to GEF. Okay, so, so we have not in any, like as, and I looked maybe to my alumni colleagues, but like have, has council been cutting GEF over the years? Maybe, maybe you can comment over that or follow up with me offline but I appreciate that. Thank you, Councillor Jans. Councillor Stevenson. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, a number of threads to, to go through. Maybe just sticking with GEF for a moment. You know, certainly certainly heard, heard the need. My recollection is that we haven't typically funded the operations of permanent supportive housing. Or, or the operations of any housing we've invested in the capital or provided the land. Is that true? That's correct. Okay, so this would be a, 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 a sort of a departure from our current investment strategy in affordable housing and supporting, supporting folks in affordable housing. I'm not sure I would characterize what GEF does as affordable housing though. Oh, uh, okay. I mean, I think, I think, I think they're affordable seniors housing, are they not? They are, but they're under a different authority, like a different act. Um, but is Stacey Galatly online? Perhaps she could respond. Uh, yes, that's, that's right. So um, it is intended to be affordable, independent uh, living for seniors, regulated differently uh, than the rest of the affordable housing would be regulated. Okay, great, great. Um, Just in terms of um, HSOC, uh, so, you know, really pleased to hear uh, Edmonton Police Commission and Edmonton Police Service committing to funding that after 2025 in terms of their, their staff and their resources for that. Have we budgeted for an ongoing contribution of our, um, our side of things in terms of the peace officer and Edmonton Fire Rescue Service staff after 2025? I believe we have, Councillor, but yeah. I'll just confirm. I think that's kind of part of the, the operations that they're going to do for sure. Yeah. Great. Okay. And, so and if I can just add, there's, this is a pilot, so there's an evaluation component. I don't think any of us want to just to assume we did a thing and it's perfect. Uh, we are evaluating and we want to bring forward the best advice in terms of, of how we would proceed with that model. Great, great. And I think, I think that's an excellent point in terms of those adjustments. You know, just want to be sure that... Um, that we can we can match those resources when when they're needed and when you know how that optimizes ours. Yeah, I, I think, Councillor, the caution I would ha say only is that we don't know yet what those resources will be, uh, depending on how much success or not we have with the ongoing operation. So I just want to put on the table is that I, I think if things pan out how we hope they pan out, um, then that would work. But if 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 not, it might be a different story. So. Sure. No, I think that's wise. I think I think again, if there are reasons to to shift or 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 discontinue or discontinue in the current form in some way based on evaluation or based on different strategic opportunities, um, I would just hate to see it be just a, a budget issue that we we ran out of capacity there. Yeah. No, I think it's fair. But I mean, I, I think this is not just about ASHOC. This is about encampments. This is about cleanups. This is about all those things we do around that work. So. Absolutely, I think there's, there's. Uh, I think what we have in the budget gives us enough base to um, do a lot of those things, but it, again, it does depend on how successful we are in this next year. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, just a clarification on uh, slide 19, I think it is. Um, it's looking at some of the OP12 reallocations and savings. Just wanted to get some clarity around the frontline seasonal staff, temporary to permanent. Um, so highlights, um, you know, 1.8 a year, the, the 7.3 million total. Can you help me understand how that lines up with, I think there's an unfunded service package for the 2.8-ish million? I think the first one is what we've done and what we've uh, presented so far as part of OP12. Uh, and we've essentially, what we're saying is we've done as much as we can without more funding to that. So, and I think... 
from our perspective, given the positive impacts that has on morale and a whole bunch of other mm -hmm. things in terms of job security, we do see that as an investment in core services. Yeah. But the, the unfunded packages would take us to the next level of, and, and we, we just can't do it without that funding. Right, so that's that 7.3, I think I heard you say in the presentation, that was able to be absorbed within the existing departments. There's not room for that additional 2.8 to be absorbed. Correct, okay. and, and yeah. And, and it's also a commitment that we made to the unions that we would put that unfunded package forward. Okay, great. Thanks. I'll come back for a few more. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Wright. Thank you. Um, so on the <clears throat> on attachment one, it shows for other adjustments for information purposes, um, the 50 police officers, the $9 million. My understanding of the police funding formula is that um, the limit is 30% of total expenditures. So if we're adding that in as an expense to be total tax supported expenditures, does that not then allow the police funding formula to be increased another 30, that 30%, like an extra 2.7 million? So when we calculate the 30%, we take the 537 million for EPS funding, we back off the $9 million, we, so we remove it. And, that, and then we divide it by this expenditure. So that ends up bringing them just below the, the thir three to 30 percent. So oh. it, it kind of caps them off. So we don't take, we don't penalize and we don't add for. for right, because grants weren't supposed to be included right. in that formula either, right? So, yes, okay, so, back, so that is taken out of yes, the, we the back end it formula? Out. Okay. Yes. Okay, awesome. Um, and then just looking back from what. Um, what the department's budgets were in the 2023-2026 cycle and what they are compared to now in attachment two. Um, I, I see the city managers was up around 45 or 50 million more, but that's because you've taken into account the communications and the talent management and that, right? Yeah, I think that reflects the org structure and I, and I don't think a lot of those folks are, you know, in the city manager's office, they report directly to the city manager, and that's sort of supporting the whole concept of we, we didn't need a, a, a deputy city manager in between those two oh, positions. Yeah. Okay, but then I'm looking at some other departments, and I'm just looking for an explanation as to why there's some differences there. Um, so community services, I'm seeing anywhere between about 30 to 40 million more than what was in the like, so community services in the 2023-2026 in the budget, page 430, um, it shows an adjusted budget there for 259 million, but then when I add up everything on attachment two, now there's, their budget is a total of 291 million. And then, I mean, and then that goes on for 24, 25, 26, and I'm just wondering what extra's been added in there. So if you're, you're, you're working from the approved budget document on the website and then you're adding these and you're trying to recalculate? I'm looking at the, the budget that was provided last fall. Yeah, so it, I just, like we can, we can do that math for you. I would just caution that depending on which, if you went to the meeting to pick up the, the meeting material to pick up that, it would be the original document. If you went to the website, it would be the adjusted document. And don't forget that we would have administrative adjustments in there, so you we probably need to help you reconcile okay. those numbers. Okay, so we can do that, what, the 23rd, 24th, I think it is? <laughs> yeah, like we can yeah. look at, we can look at telling you, showing you what that changes. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, and I think that's all I need, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Wright. Councilor Cartmill. Great, thank you. Uh, I've got a f several questions. I'm going to start with uh, GEF. So um, maybe for clarity then. It is my understanding that GEF operates essentially two sets of housing, the lodge program and the apartment program. That's correct. Right. I don't know much about as much about the apartment program. It's my understanding that rent for the lodge program is capped at roughly 85% of a person's old age pension allotment. That used to be the guiding principle. 
that used to be the guiding principle. So sounds familiar, but I would just, okay. I'm going to defer to whether we have a housing expert online. Right. Yeah, we certainly do. I'll pass over to Crystal Kajenner, uh, Director of Affordable Housing and Homelessness. Hi. Um, yeah, it's Council correct, or Carmel, that's more or less correct. Basically, the province sets an accommodation rate for each um, senior, and depending on, it's set, it's, it's set according to their income, so it depends what their income is, but at the end of the day, they have to be left with a minimum amount of money, so it's a little bit different, but it, it effectively are... Um, I think the amount of money left is around 350 bucks at the end of the month. Yeah. And it's, so it's essentially an, RH, an RGI program. So GEF, technically speaking, does not provide health services, correct? They provide housing. They accommodate home care to come into that housing place, but they do not provide health care, correct? That's correct. So we need to be careful about that. Now, I, do we have specific detail on the service package that they've asked for? Like I, I, maybe I've missed this, but I only, I, and I have not been, I will just say, I've not been briefed by either administration or GEF about what it is that they're asking for and why. So is there, is there a specific detail on what they're seeing or what they're looking for? Or is it just a line? Like, I, I see uh, a number, but I'm not sure what the rationalization of the number is. So, just looking at attachment two, the summary indicates that it's the needs of the lodge program, the client, the needs of the clients have changed, and staffing levels have not. Although they've implemented several initiatives to support clients, they don't believe this can be done without increases in the FTE to the lodges. So, they're specifically looking to increase FTE for lodge accommodations. Right, per, like a, on a, almost on a ratio basis, I suppose. More FTEs, I guess, is the long and the short of it. Yeah. So, I don't think council has ever reduced their, uh, what has been allocated to GEF, but they went a long time without asking for anything more. Seems to me their last request was in the order of 400,000 a few years ago. Yeah, so I, I mean, I have the funding going back to like 1997. Yeah. 1997, it was 2.3 million. It has gone up. It looked like it went down in 2004, but then has increased to 4.9 million. The last increase would have been, so right now from 2022 to 2026, annual funding is 4.9. From 2020 to 2021, that was 4.6, so 300,000. 300,000, I was off. So, and what was it in 2004? Um, in, in 2003, it was 3.25 million. In 2004, it was 2.7 million. And somewhere here in my messages, I have the reason for that. Yeah. So it, it dipped and then has gone from 2.7 up to 4.9 for this four year cycle. And I, like not, I'm just saying that those are the numbers. I'm not trying to no <laughs> no underlying message or anything there, but that's the, because they're asking for 2.7 million, I think, uh, for an increase. Do I have that number correct? Annual? Yeah, 2.8 roughly. 2.8. When you round it. Okay. Uh, I will come back. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cartmel. Councillor Rice? Uh, thank you, Mayor Sohi. So, First question about EPL uh, re request. Uh, do you have the numbers last year and the request is a month? Um, because I remember it's over $1 million. So right now, they reduced to the 449000 right? And it starts in 2025. Do you have, because I'm, I'm, I'm wondering and for them to cover both space space expansion and then FTEs. They asked last year, I remember it's like $1.3 million or something like that. And then right now they reduce almost less than half. Yeah, so. I'm just looking for that. Yeah. Um, um, 
So, they, so maybe go to your next question. Yes, we'll yeah, I will. That. That's what I, I try to do. Go to my next question. My next question, and then uh, in the presentation this morning and public presentation, talk about EPS uh, 2024 increase. There is one item is a $2.9 million for the Health Street. But I thought that Health Street one is already uh, in, reflected in the 2023 budget. And then this is not, a, is this additional in the 2024 to 2026? So it's not additional, Councillor Wright. When the uh, HSOC initial initiative was approved, EPS received one-time funding or multi-year funding for 2023 and 2024. The, the 2024 amount is 2.899. That will be their final year of getting CSWB money for HSOC, after that, they will fund it out of their funding formula. Oh, uh, okay. So I, I say that's his last time for yeah, the next year. Yeah, it's the last year. They got it over a two-year period. And so this that'll be the last year that they get funding from community. So is Safety this $2.9 million already refracted in the, in the budget proposed in front of us? It was in yeah. the approved 2023 to 2026. You don't need to adjust for that. Yeah, so there is no, no impact on the tax levy. No, not at all. Wonderful. Thank you for that clarification. That is my question. Um, so the next one, um, the next one is about the deficit. Uh, because we keep talking about the tax increase major, uh, manually, oh, majority, sorry for my, for my English, it's, it's close to the end. Majority, majority um, from like 1.6 percent, and for them, please. I really want to get a clarification on this deficits, and then in September, and the proposed to us is 73.8 million dollars, and among us is 43 million dollars salary set settlement. So, is that number still the same or changed? And total deficit number and the salary settlement number? Uh, the salary settlement number hasn't changed. The deficit number will likely change with our Q3 financial reporting. We're expecting that to come down closer to the $50 million range. Of $50, 50 million. That's correct. Okay, so that means the majority and for the deficit is, and is the salary settlement. Because our settlement, if not change, is $43 million still. Well, so I would just be careful that the deficit that we report is a lot of surplus and deficits across the city, across multiple branches. Um, so I would, be, I would be cautious about pointing to one single number that causes that. It's a multitude of variances that add up across the corporation. Uh, of course, I understand that specifically from mathematics. Right now, and the revenue, our city and in the budget presents is $58 million, but the expenses and for 2024 is over $100 million. And then that specifically and really clearly fracked and in the report. But I do want to understand um, this is not um, increase and it is actually to refract. We have to pay back from 2019 to 2023 for the salary settlement. So I just want to get that clarification. And because based on the salary settlement, is demonstrated very clear is from 2019 to 2023. So we have to pay that amount. And $43 million, that is a fixed amount, and there's no negotiation. Thank you, Councillor Reyes. Yeah, all oh, my uh, time is yeah. out. Uh, <laughs> well, I, have, I will Tang. come back. Thank Councilor you. Tang. Great, thank you. <clears throat> I think just some of the other questions triggered a few things for me. Um, so, just on that line of questioning around GEF, um, I think you have mentioned the legis they're under different legislation. So it's the Senior Housing Legislation Act and the Affordable Housing Act. So if I can just clarify them, do these acts outline different responsibilities for municipalities? Crystal, can I rely on you? Councillor sure. oh, Go ahead, Crystal. Uh, 
So, uh, sorry, uh, Stacey. Um, yes, um, basically GEF has its own ministerial order that outlines um, what it's responsible for, but it's consistent with other HMBs that provide the senior lodge program across the province, where basically um, the province or they can requisition the city for operating funds to offset the cost of operating the lodge, the lodge program. And so that's why that's different from other housing bodies. And that's why we're, that's why they're on our budget as an agency. Okay. So just to, to kind of clarify earlier, the, the comment around, um, they're not treated the same as a permanent supportive housing because of that piece you just mentioned. Um, and hence we do, so we do cover operating and, and all that, whatever kind of is needed as directed by that ministerial order. And then I, I feel like you probably did highlight this the last time this came up at executive committee, but if you can remind me, what is the criteria for requisition? Is this specifically for the deficit or is it could be anything? Um, I think technically it's a deficit. They're able to requisition them at the end of the year for a deficit, but in practice, council has been approving their budget, um, you know, ahead of time mm -hmm. uh, and, they're, and they haven't had a deficit. So they hadn't requisition, had to requisition for a deficit at the end of the year. So we haven't, they haven't formally had to use that requisition power previously, or at least not in recent memory. And just to, just to add to that council sure. thing. So they, they, um, they provide a budget ask to council in the fall and, and that's the 4.9 million Stacey was talking mm -hmm. about that we fund for them. And then they, were, they can come back in the first quarter of the subsequent year if they ran a deficit, if they didn't have sufficient funding and they can requisition council for that as well. They've never, they've never done that. And this is not a, this is just additional ask, right? Yeah, it's Correct. not a, it's, yeah. it's not this a is not deficit. The deficit. So this is an additional service. So, package, so you know. technically it doesn't quite meet that threshold, but they, anyways, I understand. Um, Okay, so those are my just two follow-up for now. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Neck. Uh, so first, just a quick que a process question, uh, Mayor Sohi. So um, are we asking, I'm just trying to go order of operations because I don't think we've actually cross-referenced capital and operating and I'm just wanting to make sure like we're asking a bunch of good questions. I'm just yep. trying to figure so, out what, uh, what's, that's I, that. I might have misheard. Actually, I was spoke. actually go checking that. Going, I was I was checking that, and when I went through my speaking notes, Did I, I was prepared. That? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I was said that as uh, no, do, 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 as a reminder, council approved 2026 budget last December. What is before us today are four separate set of proposed adjustment capital operating Bradford waste. Following questions of any of the matters before us today. Sorry, I missed that. So yep. we can ask. So yep. we're just yep. going to yep. throw all the questions out now and then get on into all the, the uh, everything. Yeah, Thank on you. All. Perfect. That's good. Uh, well, I'll start on operating anyway. Then uh, just just to double check. Um, so last when we had the last council meeting, we had a presentation that talked about uh, the work that's been done on OP12, and, and you included more of that in today. Uh, of the 15 million for 2023, I just want to guess, I want to get clarification because essentially, since we're being asked to uh, address the $5 million gap on transit fare revenue, I, I guess is it fair? So is, is that, uh, so we technically then in 2023 would have only had 10 million of that 15 million if we end up offsetting the, the 5 million in the budget. Is that fair to say? Yeah, we had originally set aside $5 yep. million dollars, and when ridership seemed to be coming back yep. and we made the decision to release it against the $15 million, only to find out as the year progressed yep. that the wrong type of, not the wrong, that's maybe the wrong word, but the, yeah. the ridership was not the, the ridership that we needed coming back. Correct. But by that point, we had released it, and now we have an additional shortfall. Absolutely, it makes perfect sense. That's that's great. And so I guess maybe the question, maybe to you, Mr. Corbold, is 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 there any thought around 2024? Because if we technically have only found 10 million this year, not 15 million, because we're going to have to make the transit fare difference. Have you thought about does the 2024 15 million dollar number become 20 in your mind to to make up that amount or? Have you given any thought to that? Yeah, I think I might defer to ETS on this one. Well, I, and maybe, like, let me just jump in here for a second, because while we did that early when we thought that revenues were trending properly, yep. and, and this budget includes an increase in tax levy, 
to fund some of the transit shortfall. It is actually not the entire transit shortfall. Correct. We are only funding, we are only asking for five million when we're projecting a shortfall of 11 or 12 million. Yeah. So I think we could, I mean, we could look at doing that. I think it, I'm just cautious about compounding issues. I, I understand, I'm just, I'm trying to think of the, the spirit of the motion that was made last year was that we were looking to have a $15 million reduction each of the next four years. And due to no fault of anyone, other than transit fare is just transit fare and, and we're, we're responding to it as we can. I guess the way I've sort of looked at it is that it feels like this year has then been ultimately a $10 million and then the next three years would be 15 and if that's the case then it's not actually 60 million, it's a $55 million exercise, which might be fine for council. I just, I wanna get a sense of has there been any thought around that? So the only other thing that I would say is we we're trying very hard to find that money ongoing, not just one time. Yeah. Um, because if we don't find it ongoing, then in, in year five, $15 million just comes back into your budget. Yes. We've also worked hard to try and do some personnel savings. Um, so when you see the reports come forward on the operating financial update, you'll see personnel savings in there. Yeah. The reason I ha the reason we haven't used them against this 15 is I don't know how I can justify that when we're running a deficit mm -hmm. in other programs. Okay. All right, that's helpful. Uh, not a lot of time. Maybe I'm going to ask a random capital question to Mr. Robar actually. Uh, off leash dog parks. <laughs> Let's have a rant. I have only a few seconds. We had a really good pop up program. Is that program going to continue uh, if, unless there's, or do you need funding to actually be able to do that permanently going forward? Because I think it was a huge success. Yeah, but that program was a pilot program. Yes. So it, it concludes in uh, the end of, no uh, end of November. So that so program will not continue after. Do we have a sense of ballpark of what we, I think we spent 300,000 on that to do 30 locations. Like there's no budget request, but if it is a program that is quite popular, I'm just curious. Is that a capital expense for, for in, in your area to buy the necessary equipment? Or do you yeah, want to get back it, to me on that one? I, I could probably have uh, Craig answer that question. Okay, well, I'm out of time, so that was just a... Yeah, well, yeah, I would also back. just say it didn't meet the definition of core when we Fair. ran it yep. through OP12, yep. so... Got it. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Salvador. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'll actually go back to uh, something that was mentioned this morning during the presentation, at least I think it was, and I wanted to clarify uh, what I heard. So with the community property safety team, um, I'm, am I hearing that this will need now be funded internally and, and that does not need to come forward? Uh, that is correct, no, sir. yes. Um, currently, we're, uh, we're we're going to continue with the pilot at a permanent level, and work with the uh, uh, corporate uh, vacancy management program to uh, look at the growth component of it. Okay. Okay. Thanks for that. So, is it it's fair to say then that it's moving from from a pilot to permanent, and then there is intention to support growth through some of those vacancies. Correct. Correct. Okay. Okay. Um, I guess why I'm just I'm just curious why it was included as uh, as unfunded. Like I'm really happy that we're able to to Count, deal with it internally. Councilor Salvador, we had it in there originally as a service package, and the decision to fund it internally was made after the budget was published. Gotcha. Okay, great. I mean, very happy to hear that. So, um, I will switch gears. Uh, a relatively high level question around transit. Um, you know, looking looking at the slide showing the spectrum of core and non-core services, um, of course bus service really sticks out to me and uh, as it stands today, without advancing any of the unfunded packages, when, when would the next opportunity to see growth be? So we, without funding any of the un unfunded service packages, the next opportunity for growth would be uh, during the construction of the new transit garage. So construction would probably be complete in 2028, 2029-ish. Uh, however, the, uh, the precursor hours service, there is still opportunity to uh, grow services to the tune of about 28 buses that we have capacity for in between now and then depending on what happens with 
uh, Valley Line uh, Southeast Precursor Service. Okay, so if nothing changes, we're looking at like 2028, 2029, um, but then the two levers that are possibly in front of us would be the redeployment of the Valley Line Southeast Hours. Uh, question on the satellite garage as well. I know that is sort of dependent on the 40, 40 buses. Are there opportunities to play with that number? Um, sort of scale scale that down if necessary? Yeah, certainly there's obviously an opportunity with the, with the satellite garage if you wanted to uh, scale it by increments of five or or, um, or so, so there's definitely zero to 40 that you can play around with that satellite facility, for sure. Great, um, I'll leave it there, thank you. Councillor Principe, can you take the chair? I'll take the I chair. just wanna follow up on, on that. The report that was presented to uh, the committee identified 270,000 hours of service gap for bus service, right? That is correct. Hi. And uh, so if we wait till the garage opens, 20, 28, 29, then got to do some internal refitting of the of the system, you're looking at probably 29, 20, 30 that we would not be adding. If we don't add more service, that deficit of 270,000 hours probably double. It will not, grow. It, it will continue to grow, right? So I think that's what I want to understand opportunities that are front of us, whether council want to take those opportunities is a part of the discussion. One is the reallocation or redeployment of Valley Line Southeast service hours that you have employees, right? And you have buses, but you need to make it permanent, right? That's correct. And that is about, I think about $6.7 million on that range? 5.3. Uh, 5.3, oh. Uh, annualized or annually? Yep. Annual, okay, okay, five point three. And can you give me a sense about so that will allow us? To, I, I understand that will be about seventy thousand hours of service. Seventy thousand hours, that's correct. Right? And we would still have two hundred thousand hours of service gap. Uh, so if we were able to take on the opportunity of uh, um, satellite garage, right? Uh, can you, how much can we add with that? Uh, if you were doing 40 buses, it would be up to about 100,000 service hours. Okay. So 70, still be short. <laughs> uh, and with the potential of still continue to having that grow, a service hour gap growing with the so much, like I, I'm really, really excited that our population is growing and our province and our pro city is growing by 32,000 people, I think, last year, right? And, uh, but that means added pressure on the service. Can you remind me when the restructuring of the entire network was done? You weren't here then. Yeah. Uh, I, don't, I don't think even Kerry was here then, right? Uh, there were a number of routes that were cut So to, we, to supplement or grow the network or increase frequency on high, high frequency network. So yeah, during the network redesign, we redeployed the services that we had into creating the new network design itself. Right. So we used all of the service hours that we currently had in the system and redeployed them for a, a more efficient transit system. Right, right, because I remember. And that was in 2021, so I was definitely here then. Yeah, okay, you were there, because I remember we started about talking about restructuring uh, in end of 2015 when I left, right? And uh, at that time I raised huge concerns about reduction in suburban communities and we saw that reduction and huge implications of not having access to public transit in suburban communities. But I also heard during that time that once the restructuring is done, we will look for opportunities to add back service into suburban communities and we did that through on-demand, which we made permanent, absolutely good investment. That's correct. Right? Okay, so I think I'm going back to that promise that was made to those communities that uh, we need to uh, look at. Okay, so I, that's something I will definitely be exploring, both of those uh, valley line reallocation and the, uh, and the, uh, uh, and the satellite garage, uh, 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 both. That, so satellite garage is capital and operating? Can you give me a breakdown? 
the satellite facility is, is capital and operating, correct? Do we know the range of capital and the operating? I'll defer to Carrie for that. Oh, is Carrie online? She is, yeah. Okay. Yes, yeah, so uh, as Eddie mentioned, it's scalable. So at the top end, uh, and depending, I'll go with the lower cost option of diesel buses. Looking at 40 of them, it's a capital of 31.5 million. Uh, and then the operating side uh, at the end of uh, the entirety, we'd be looking at 23.6 million. Uh, so it, it goes at the high end of 12.4 million uh, a year for the service hour costs for 40 buses, but it's completely scalable. Like we could start lower, right? Then eventually build it up. But 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 I think what I want to understand is the opportunity is now. Like, can we wait another year or two years to uh, uh, look at the satellite garage or that opportunity will, uh, will not? Yeah. If we lose that opportunity, then we'll have to wait till 2029, 20, 2030. It'll depend, as Eddie said, depends on what you decide for the Valley Line precursor hours. If you don't fund those, yeah. we're retiring those buses and you'd have that equivalent space in the facility. But the satellite garage opportunity is a now opportunity. We don't have it in the future. It's a very unique situation that we're in okay. uh, and we have access to it now. Okay, got it. Okay. Thank you all. I'll stop you for now. I'll come back for other questions. Uh, and I will move the second round. Second. Thank you. Please vote on another round. I don't know if Councillor Jans is in the meeting or to mark him absent. He just left probably. I don't know if he's online. He's on virtually not. Councillor Jans, are you online? I don't see him. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that has carried. I'll pass back the chair. Thank you. Uh, next is Councillor Stevenson. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, very excited to hear about the community property safety team. That's, that's excellent to hear. It also seemed like on slide five, um, Funding for MOU partners was uh, something that was identified that could be. Could yeah, be that was just two partners. That was Treaty Six and M um, and A, or the new M and A. Sorry, I should know that right now, but I don't. Okay, and so that will um, we'll be able to follow through on the commitment in terms of providing funding that funding to them yeah. to hire. Correct. Someone? One has already hired, and we're working on the details, and the other is w w we expect will. So yes. Great, that's excellent news. Um, I just wanted to touch base on um, the permanent enhanced cleaning for ETS and also the city center optimization. Um, so am I correct in remembering that those programs were both funded through grants initially? That's correct. Okay, and when did those grants run out? I will have to defer to Craig and, and carry on those. The um, the Center City project, uh, Center City Optimization Project, the funding is to be spent by the end of March 2024. Okay, okay. So. And sorry for the transit cleaning, it's uh, April of 24. Okay, okay, great. So, um, you know, th those are two service packages. They're very close to my heart. But if we weren't to to fund them, this month, we still do have that funding. We could maintain the service levels until until the spring, until March and April. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's that's reassuring. Um, enhanced encampments. Um, there, in the summary of the service package, it speaks to access to 50 bridge housing units. Just wanting to understand, are those 50 new bridge housing units that, that could be funded through that enhanced package? And if so, what, what's that standalone cost of the 50 units? If I can defer to Stacey Galatly on this one, please. Hi, thank you. Yes, the intention is within that enhanced package to fund uh, those additional units. Uh, and that number, just waiting for uh, my 
item to come up here, uh, I think is in the realm of 2 million and, and some, but I'll confirm that in just a moment. Interesting. Um, cause that, that seems, that seems like quite a deal compared to some of the other bridge housing, um, uh, funding that we've looked at. So that would be 50 bridge housing units. Is that year round or is that a seasonal? Uh, the intention there is year round. I'll let, uh, again, uh, director for affordable housing and homelessness, Crystal Jenner, uh, to tap in here. Uh, yeah, thanks for the question, Council Stevenson. I think that uh, it is dependent on us finding an appropriate facility. Um, so that, that would be the only caution. But I think that some of the contracts that we are funding uh, towards the end and some of the ones previously outside of sort of the pandemic setting <clears throat> have suggest that we should that 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 should be a reasonable amount of budget to work with um, in trying to secure those units. But the exact number that we get would be dependent on the property that we find. OK, great. Thank you. That's that's incredibly helpful. And that's 2.5 uh, million councillor students. 2.5. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, with the core encampment response, uh, just in terms of the FTEs, so I think it's 30, 39 or so FTEs. What's the split in terms of, um, and I apologize, that might have been in the, in the detailed description, but just in terms of the split of FTEs for, for peace officers versus cleaning uh, teams? I'll get David to respond, please. You bet. Thanks very much for the question. Um, from the peace officer team, we would be looking at 29 FTEs, with the remainder being, I believe, uh, with the cleanup team. That's right. Yep. Seven are dedicated in the core package. Seven were dedicated for in cam and cleanup. Okay. So it'd be like a crew lead and, and six laborers. So what and I, I should clarify that for the peace officer team, that includes... Uh, some of the background support that we need in order to operate that uh, in the most effective and efficient way. Right. No, very fair. So what does what does that look like? I mean, for starting with the cleaning, I'll just be quick and come back. But seven, so seven new FTEs for cleaning. So what does that mean in terms of response times? Does that shorten it from 10 days to five days? Like, are there some service measures, service level measures we can look at there? Um, we've, we've, Tried to calculate that. I think it's tough to put an exact figure on just based it, just based on the demand fluctuates. Mm -hmm. um, and then the demand on cleaning is also dependent on um, on on the encampments being vacated. Uh, so the encampment cleanup team can only clean up those that are um, uh, vacant or with active um, participation from our enforcement teams. So I, I don't know if we would necessarily be able to give like a very a detailed accurate number on one additional crew, it, it would make an impact, but um, I'd, we'd have to make some more assumption. Okay, thanks, sorry, that's my, my time. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Cardinal. Thank you, so I have some questions about uh, Fort Edmonton Park and FEMCO. Uh, now, we a letter was sent um, by the FEMCO board uh, and it was my assumption that that was distributed wall of council, but I don't think it was. So um, apologies for that. It was, I forwarded that at the break for those that didn't see it. Um, and I just have a few questions about that. Uh, so the, the request for FEMCO is for 2.2 million and a healthy chunk of that is uh, a $1.5 million payment that FEMCO had to return to the federal government under the CEWS program. Do I have that correct? That's $1.7 million. Yeah, I think it's $1.5 million plus a $200,000 interest fee. Yeah, that's correct. Right, the original grant was one point five. Do we have any clarity on why uh, FEMCO is not eligible for this grant program, but for example, tell us world of science is there's some suggestion that there's an ownership structure difference, but I'm struggling to see what the difference is that makes one organization eligible and the other not. Do we have any, any clarity on that? Yeah, because as FEMCO is wholly owned by the city, uh, similar to Explorer Edmonton, they weren't eligible for those programs. Tell us world of science, uh, as the space of science center foundation is a separate entity. They were eligible. So it is purely based on us being the sole shareholder of FEMCO. So the TELUS World of Science is wholly owned by somebody else? 
Yeah, we own the building and we lease it to the this Edmonton Space and Science Center Foundation, and the foundation was the one who received the grant from the Fed, federal government. But we own the buildings at Fort Edmonton Park. Yeah, it was because we own Femco. We own the company that's managing the park. Oh, that was the, the difference. Okay. So that's the clarity then. And then there is, so that's 1.7, and then the balance, $500,000 of that 2.2 request, that's to provide matching funding for a grant that would come from uh, Tourism Alberta, is that correct, Roger? Yeah, that's correct. And because of the, the pay down of the federal grant, they just don't have the cash reserves in order to fully take advantage of the tourism grant. So if they, if, if they do not get a $2.2 million um, injection now, then they cannot actually, they can't activate that grant. So that's $500,000 of sort of lost opportunity cost. Yes. That's correct. Yeah. And then, but the $1.7 million that they've had to return to the federal government, that's lost money. So if they don't get, if they don't get at least that 1.7 million as, as a cash support now, uh, is there some other remedy or some other thing that they could get that helps their operations or, or is an equivalent approach? No, they, I mean, their strategy is they, they've put a hold on additional programming, their winter programming. Um, without it, they're projecting by 2025, they've been in a significant deficit position uh, as far as their cash reserves go. Uh, so if it's not a $1.5 million one-time grant, I guess, or... or, or transfer uh, can we make adjust adjustments to other amounts owed can we uh, make additions to the uh, operating the operating monies that they already receive is there other strategies that we've talked about no I think in any case you know it might be a different mechanism to fund Femco to that amount whether it was an increase in the tax levy to their operations or a direct a direct grant to deal with the situation they're now with the, the federal grant being reserved or reversed but um, in either way, there would be a cash infusion from the city. And if they don't get it, then the, essentially the operation just spirals. Yeah, the projections are, you know, they could probably survive one more year with the revenues they have uh, and paying back the loan, but really wouldn't be able to expand their winter programming and, and would fall into a deficit position by 2025. Okay. Okay, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cardwell. Councillor Wright. Do we have time in two minutes? <laughs> we are at five. I wasn't even looking at the clock. Five o'clock. Okay, almost. Okay, we'll stop here. We'll resume tomorrow. Right? 9.30? 9.30? Sure? Want to come back tomorrow? We'll be back tomorrow. Until then, we are on recess.